All right. Everybody ready? Good evening and welcome to the uh, Federal Way City Council meeting for April 16th, 2024. Would you all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, All right, good evening. I will uh, uh, excuse uh, Councilmember Tran, who is out of the country on vacation and unavailable. Um, all right, uh, ceremonies and recognition. First, we have the proclamation for um, uh, Black Wellness Week, April 15 through 19. Councilmember Esepidasa. Thank you, Mayor. Oops, sorry. I'm going to ask Mr. Uh, Keith Blocker to step up to the podium, and he's the CEO of uh, Momentum Professional Strategy Partners. Whereas Black Wellness Week began in 1915 to promote community-driven health and wellness goals that are tailored to the needs of the black community, and whereas Black Wellness Week fosters ad advocacy, education, holistic well-being, and promoting physical, mental, emotional, and social health for all communities, and Whereas a community-driven approach focusing on leveraging existing resources and capacities is essential for the effective implementation of Black Wellness Week, and whereas Black Wellness Week reminds us that health is the building block on which every, everything, including political rights and economic self-sufficiency, rests. Now, therefore, we, the understand mayor and city council members of the City of Federal Way, do hereby proclaim April 15 to April 19, 2024, as Black Wellness Week and encourage the community to advocate for health as a human right for all. Signed the 16th day of April, 2024. And if you have anything to say, please go ahead and I'll join you there with your proclamation. Uh, first, I want to say thank you for um, this proclamation. It's a great honor to be here today. My name is Keith Blocker. I'm the CEO of Momentum Professional Strategy Partners. And I'm here with my wife, the co-founder of uh, Elevate Black Wellness. So I want to thank you again. Uh, when we think about the importance and significance of wellness, it's our stance that black wellness is the wellness of all communities. And we really want to make the point that the best way to protect yourself from disease, um, COVID-19, influenza, any kind of disease, is to focus on your own wellness. While uh, vaccines are important, it's our belief that focusing on mental wellness, spiritual wellness, and your own personal health is the best way to protect you. Uh, so I'm honored to be here today to say thank you for this amazing proclamation, joining eight other cities in the state of Washington to proclaim April 15th through the 19th as Black Wellness Week. Um, good evening, Mayor and uh, Federal Way City Council members. It is an honor to be with you all tonight. We are just so appreciative of this opportunity to acknowledge and amplify Black Wellness Week. Um, back in 2017, one of the reasons why it's so critical for us, my husband and I have a son that just turned eight, thankfully, but back in 2017, he was one years old. We were just pregnant with our, our, first, our second child. And he was experiencing some issues breathing, and so we rushed him to the hospital. Thankfully, we were close to hospitals. We were two minutes away. The hospitals took him in. Sorry, the urgent care took him in, and he was able to be transferred to the pediatric ICU because they found that he had reactive airway disease. And I bring that up because there's so many there are so many things when I think about our story that allowed us to make sure that our our son could see his eighth birthday. We were two minutes away from the hospital. We had health care insurance. We were housed. We had a vehicle. All of those things were opportunities for us to make sure that our son could have the wellness that he has today. And, and so when we think about our, our community members that don't have that same access, we recognize with the passion that we have for this work and elevating black wellness, that not all of our community members have that same access. When we think about the disparities that were highlighted in COVID-19, 
those disparities were long-standing disparities. There were so many folks, I would imagine so many folks even in this room, that unfortunately lost family members. And so when we're thinking about why we're celebrating Black Wellness Week, because we truly believe, just as we saw with curb cuts, and I bring that up because of universal design, when we improve things for our most impacted communities, we're really improving things for all of our communities. So again, we are so honored to be with you tonight. We appreciate your work in, in federal way, and thank you again for your leadership. Right, thank you. Hello, Mayor. Hello, Council. My name is Terrence Hamilton, um, and I just want to extend my thanks to you all for supporting this. Um, y'all stand, I stand before y'all as a man who lost his father with a health condition at the age of 41, very young. Um, and so celebrating Black Wellness Week and doing this work means a lot to me, and it hit home for me. Um, so like I always say, this is officially the second day of this big celebration and um the only state that's actually doing this and so i just i'm just so grateful um this one goes out for all the young kids who have health conditions all the parents that got health conditions big shout outs to my mother who fought an addiction um lost custody of her kids but also fought the state to get her kids back you know so when we talk about black wellness week it's powerful, it's encouraging, and I just thank you all so much for supporting this and getting behind this. This means a lot to me and this means a lot to our community um, as we, you know, continue to fight, um, especially, specifically some of the disparities that we face within our community. So thank you so much once again. I'm honored to be here with y'all um, and honored to do this work with my team. Thank you all so much. Great. Thank you. All right, thank you once again. Appreciate it. <clears throat> okay. Uh, now we will move on to uh, Mayor's Emerging Issues and Report. Um, first, uh, the first item, and uh, I'll have, uh, uh, Bill's got the uh, uh, page there for the uh, Mayor's Emerging Issues and Report. Uh, in light of uh, recent uh, uh, very, very violent crime uh, that have occurred in our community, uh, specifically the horrible tragedy with the two-year-old uh, at the IHOP Winco parking lot, uh, and then the same day where we had shots on Pacific Highway and 334th uh, in the invest uh, that investigation and some other things that happened near contemporaneously, um, and as well other uh, concerning uh, incidents around the community, um, I worked with our uh, acting uh, Chief, uh, uh, Chief uh, Andy Wong is out of country uh, right now. Um, I had a family loss, uh, and he uh, uh, is attending to that uh, with his wife and uh, family uh, in Korea. Uh, we do have uh, acting uh, and uh, uh, deputy chief, but acting chief uh, Kyle Sumter, who will give us a, uh, a rundown on what we're doing uh, to make sure that we're doing everything we can to address a violent crime in our community. With that, Chief Sumter. Thank you, Mayor. Under the Mayor's direction, we have implemented a uh, violent crimes task force within the police department, and we are not eager to share all the details with the public because we don't want the people we are going after to know what we're doing and when and who to look out for. I'll share with you that we already made a significant arrest yesterday, and as this week goes on, I expect we will have more. It's an opportunity for us to as we grind through policing on a day-to-day -day basis, sometimes the tendency is to become siloed. That is, detectives are very busy with a busy caseload and they tend to focus on their caseload. And patrol officers are very busy responding to 911 calls and they are, can become siloed in that regard. And SOU doing their niche and so on and so forth. And traffic officers out there riding motorcycle tickets and so forth. What this task force does is 
grabs whoever we need on a given operation, on a given day, depending on who we're going for and what we're looking for and so forth, to bring them all together and go out as an emphasis and track down the people we need to catch. And we're also partnering with agencies outside of the city of Federal Way, and this will expand and contract and develop and evolve based on the moment, based on the needs of the moment, and that's what we're doing. All right. And it's well, exciting. Well, thank you, Chief, and thank you for, hey. the, uh, for the flexibility. I think it is important when we talk about the individuals that we've got, uh, and I think the way the flexibility is so important is it's not just a static group of officers. So they, you know, individual officers have, they work you know, five days a week, have a day or two off, and then they're back on. Well, what happens when they're not on? That's why you need that uh, flexibility um, uh, in the system uh, to make sure that we're doing that. But this is our number one priority, and we're going to move heaven and earth to not only find uh, the, uh, the person who's responsible for the horrible crime uh, at IHOP uh, and, and at that time, but also um, the other crimes in our community. And uh, obviously this happened at a, you know, in broad daylight, and this is absolutely unacceptable. I'd see that uh, Councilmember Honda has a question. Yes, uh, thank you for your information. Recently, the city of Renton has had quite a number of juveniles committing some very serious crimes, and they have been working according to the news media, pretty hard to, with King County, to uh, make some changes. Have they reached out to other cities to have other cities work with them on juvenile uh, yes. issues? Yes. As a matter of fact, next week we're meeting with the King County Gun Violence Investigators Group as part of our task forcing, uh, bringing, yes, we're doing that as well. And then we got an email yesterday from the King County prosecutor about some of the things that their office are doing with juveniles and uh, with police departments. Are we working with? Her yes. Office? Okay. Good. Yes. Awesome. Every day. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. We'll report as uh, things come up. And like, uh, like the chief said, we, uh, we had an arrest. We'll get into more details about that when we can make that public. Okay. Thank you very much, chief. All right. Next on the agenda, uh, there's been a uh, uh, quite a bit of attention in regard to senior uh, senior programming and senior issues. We've got a great senior commission. We have an amazing uh, community center and staff, uh, and I wanted to make sure that we were highlighting. I've asked John to give a, uh, a, 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 pro a uh, an update on our senior programs at the Federal Way Community Center. Good evening, Mayor. Council President, uh, I am very happy to be here tonight. Uh, very proud of this program. We realize that uh, we do a lot of great work over at the community center and throughout the city, throughout our department. And one of the things, uh, an area of weakness of mine personally, is we don't tell our story very well sometimes. And there is uh, a lot to tell about our senior area. So uh, I'll be pleased here to, in a couple of moments to introduce our senior service coordinator, David Schmidt. Um, and who will be presenting to you this evening uh, about the wide variety of programs and events that he plans each and every year. Dave has been with us for 20 years. I had the pleasure of hiring him 20 years ago, and he has uh, really worked magic in Federal Way for 20 years. Uh, we have a very vibrant program, so a lot of people know about us. We'd like even more to find out about us. Uh, I've watched firsthand the excellence and growth of David's programs. Couldn't be more proud of him and his offerings. Um, these are tremendous programs, and despite being award-winning and considered among the best in the region, sometimes people don't know. So I'm um, going to have Dave come up and uh, introduce himself and give you an idea of the tremendous variety and flavor of programs that we offer for our seniors uh, here in Federal Way. So without further ado, David Schmidt. All right. Welcome, David. Thank you, John. Good evening, Mayor O'Farrell. Council President Coach Mar, Council, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. Uh, I also want to thank our Parks Director, John Hutton, uh, Deputy Director Jason Gerwin, our Senior Center, our Community Center Manager, Lee Fellsworth, and our, my Direct Supervisor, Kevin Hutchinson, for their leadership, appreciation, or their leadership and their appreciation for the programs that we provide at the Community Center. Uh, as John said, I've been with the city for 20 years. I was hired as an intern with John, uh, and specifically uh, 18 years in the senior program. Uh, I'm very proud of the program that we've built and the time that I've been here with the city and we've seen tremendous growth uh, from where we started and where we are today. Uh, we started with just a handful of activities and programs and now we're up to uh, 50 plus programs uh, actively running in the center uh, and over 100 trips a year. 
Uh, we offer a wide variety of programs that aim to enrich and enhance the community. Uh, the community center, pro I'm sorry. The community center provides uh, a unique blend of traditional senior activities and dynamic programming programs catering to active adults, 50 plus, and the broader community. We have a robust senior program. We have a, about 100, or I'm sorry, we have about 500 plus seniors coming through our building each day. We have over 100 pickleball players that come and play in our gymnasium uh, five days a week, Monday through Friday, from 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. We've got three courts available. Uh, it's over 35 hours per week that we provide pickleball at our building. It's one of our most popular programs, one of our, one of our more active programs. Uh, we have extensive fitness classes in the pool and group fitness rooms upstairs. And we have de dedicated spaces for senior programming in the senior lounge and community rooms. Um, we also serve 200 plus lunches a week. We have lunches on Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. Tuesday and Thursday we provide lunches through the Evergreen Senior Club, which are ethnic Korean meals. And then on Fridays, we have lunch that's provided by Catholic Community Services that provide a Latino, a traditional Latino meal. Some of the drop-in activities that we provide. When I say drop-in activities, you do not have to be a member to our, our facility to come in and do these drop-in activities. They're simply a dollar, two dollars, at most three dollars for these programs. We offer everything from bingo to line dancing to book club, bridge, tai chi, a memoir writing, obviously the pickleball program that I mentioned earlier, um, yoga, Qijong, which is a form of Tai Chi and yoga combined, mindful meditation, watercolor painting, and we're always adding new programs as well, depending on the season and where we're at in the year. Our fitness classes that we offer are, are second to none. We offer um, a number of different programs that are actually um, through insurance-based programs that uh, a lot of seniors qualify through their insurance for a free membership at our facility. Uh, and within that, they're able to access any of our programs that we have that I mentioned earlier, along with specific fitness programs that are designed just for them. Uh, walk and fit, uh, a senior stretch, yoga. Um, we've got other classes that are, that are more advanced, group fight, group core, um, Pilates, kickboxing, some of those other ones. We don't see as many seniors in there, but believe it or not, there are some that are in there for those classes. Uh, we also offer a wide variety of programs within our two swimming pools that we have. Um, we've got a, a leisure pool that obviously you guys have seen and a lot of work has gone into that over the past year with our new slide um, and getting that reopened. Uh, it's dedicated and has some lap lanes in that pool along with uh, channel walking. We have a lot of people that, that uh, like to channel walk and, and walk within a current. Um, and then we've got our, our, our main pool that is um, specific with lap lanes. Uh, we offer everything from deep water aerobics to shallow water aerobics in those pools and a wide variety of, of other programs as well. Uh, specialty classes and programs, a lot of these classes are, are completely free. Uh, we offer AARP driver safety programs, which, as you know, a lot of the times uh, those are provide discounts for insurances for seniors by taking those classes. Our Meals on Wheels program is out of the community center as well. We serve over 550 meals each week out of our facility. Um, we've offered fall prevention. Uh, we offer the Evergreen Senior Club, which I mentioned, Catholic Community Services lunches. Those, those lunches that I spoke about are actually um, lunches that are donation based and so it's a suggest, suggested donation of 375 but if you're unable to, to provide the 375 you, you will not be turned away um, we also offer senior rights assistance to help with wills and power of attorney and Medicare it's a one-on-one -on -one consultation that's free we do that once monthly um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the Hyde shuttle uh, the Hyde shuttle is through King County and we actually are lucky enough to have in our city, we have three buses that run Monday through Friday from the hours of 9.30 to 4 p.m. Um, it's completely free, very easy to sign up. You can sign up uh, 30 days out if you've got an appointment or something that you need to be at. Um, it also runs from the community center over to the Federal Way Senior Center, who we partner with for multiple programs. Um, we also have another volunteer transportation program as well, and we do tax preparation, some things like that from time to time as well. Before I go any further, I want to talk to you more about the community center as well before I jump into my most passionate area of our, of our senior program, our trips and excursions. But the, seniors, or the community center itself is, is 72,000 square feet, and primarily between the hours of uh, 5.30 a.m. when we open to about 2.30, 3 o'clock when the kids get out of school, it's run like a senior center. That building is primarily used by the senior citizens of our community that come in, and as I mentioned earlier, there's 500 plus seniors coming through our doors between those hours. Um, 
And so we have dedicated space and, and other rooms throughout the facility, but primarily the seniors or the community center itself operates just like a senior center would, but we've got much more space, we've got much more opportunities, whether fitness room upstairs or two swimming pools or gymnasium. So we are really lucky and fortunate to have such a great facility to be able to house all the programs that we have for our seniors. With that, like I said, the most passionate area I have is our trips and excursions. Uh, we started the program uh, when I took over the program in, in 2006. We were offering about 20 trips a year. And since then, we've grown to about 105 trips a year. So we offer a trip every Thursday in the spring and summer and every Saturday. Uh, we have everything from anything you could think of throughout the Northwest, trips to Mount Rainier, Mount St. Helens, uh, San Juan Islands, Friday Harbor. We have two trips going out this weekend uh, to the Tulip Festival up in LaConnor. So we have sold out trips for that. We have 18 going on Saturday, 18 going on Sunday. Our, our bus, we've got three buses within our department. Uh, one bus is used for our inclusion programs. They do a lot of great trips as well, similar to what I do. Um, but our senior program operates with the one bus that we have with 18 passengers. And believe it or not, that bus has been many places throughout the Northwest and even uh, as far as the Grand Canyon. Uh, we've had it to the Grand Canyon. We've had it to um, Jasper, Lake Louise, the Canadian Rockies. We've had it to Yellowstone National Park. We've had it over into Spokane, Idaho, Oregon, um, even up into Canada. Um, we do a number of, of really fun, extensive trips throughout the year. Um, we do a lot of collaborative travel. We partner with a lot of surrounding uh, senior centers, community centers, uh, to allow us to get the best prices that we can get. We usually take anywhere between 14 and 20 seniors from our facility, and then maybe 14 or 20 from another facility, which gets us right around 30 people, which really allows us to get some great pricing on, on all of our trips and activities um, that we do. Um, some other highlights that we've done, you know, when I first started doing the programming for trips and things like that, I did a lot of programming and trips that I thought that the seniors would want. And then as time went on, I found myself enjoying the trips that I was doing with them that I didn't think I'd enjoy, so I thought it'd be time to, to change things up and maybe offer some trips that I enjoyed that they might not want or, or have liked in the past. And sure enough, that took off like crazy. We do uh, a number of ball games, Mariners games. We, uh, we park right in the Terrace Club level of the parking garage, which is the, where the sky bridge is on the fifth floor of the parking garage. Very easy access in and out. Um, the seats up there are great. You have to have a, a, a ticket to be in that specific area of the stadium. So we make it as, as comfortable and as easy as possible. And for all of our programming, basically, or our trips, uh, they show up 15 minutes prior to when the trip starts, right at the community center there, and our bus leaves right from the community center. So we offer a lot of great, great trips. Um, some of the funner ones that we've done, give you an idea, we've done some Seahawks games on the road. We've been doing that for about eight years now. We've offered uh, two trips to Arizona. We offered a trip to New Orleans a couple years ago. We did Chicago. We did Monday Night Football in Chicago, which was great. And this past year was one of our best trips that we've done. It was a little bit hesitant being in a big city, but we did a trip to New York for Monday Night Football. So really, really unbelievable travel experiences these seniors have been able to, to uh, enjoy throughout <clears> our program. <throat> we also partnered with Colette Travel. I know many of you probably, I don't know if you're familiar with them. You may have seen them on Wheel of Fortune if you watch Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> but uh, we partnered with them for our extended travel. We have a group that just left for Nashville on Sunday. Um, we do some domestic things on the East Coast with them, and then we do some international travel as well. We've had trips to uh, Costa Rica. Just in the past year, we've had trips to Costa Rica, uh, Portugal, and uh, we've got some upcoming ones to Italy and a couple of other big cities throughout the world. So we also offer, um, when we're bus isn't in schedule, we also offer some of these retirement communities where I go out and speak to um, them about all the great programs that we offer some private trips. So we offer private trips to these communities that aren't able to get to our facility from time to time, and we allow them to, to rent our, our bus, and we have our drivers take them out and do a day trip just like we would do our other trips. Um, and with that, I'll leave it uh, up to you guys for some questions. If you guys have some questions, I'm sure there's some things that you probably have. Well, thank you, Dave. Uh, great presentation. Thank you for, uh, gosh, 20 years of work. Really appreciate it. You know, as we're sitting up on the dais, I, I was looking at Council Member uh, Doby, and I recall that uh, 20 years ago, uh, uh, this government body put together an advisory group. And if memory serves me correctly, I believe Council Member Doby was the chairperson of that group or definitely a, a key member on that group. And we were talking about, um, you know, that this, that this community center, what it was envisioned, would be both a, a full um, a, you know, community center for the public, but also uh, the, added, uh, uh, the added service of being a senior center. And there was a great deal of uh, conversation about that. So it's, it's great to see that come to full uh, uh, fruition.
fruition all these years later. Councilmember Hunter. Thank you. Thank you for your information. Can you talk more about the, the trips and the cost? And do you sure. have uh, scholarships for the low income seniors who might want to take one of these trips? Because I know I've looked into them and they are a little costly. Sure. Uh, depending on where you're going. But uh, yeah, if you could, sure. do you offer travel scholarships? We do. We do. We offer scholarships for all of our programming if you, if you qualify. Uh, there is 25% reduction fee for, for those that qualify for those programs, including our trips. And how do you qualify? Uh, low income, you just have to show that you're low income or whatever it may be that you have that, that shows that you're the eligible. King, the King County? Yes, I believe so. The, the, a lot of our front desk stuff handles our, our scholarships that we do, but we do have a scholarship program throughout our department for all of our programs. And it's 25% off? It is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Boy, that's a great question. Thanks for bringing that and, up. And, and just to give you an idea of the cost for these trips, our average cost is about $38 per trip, which is a full day, usually anywhere between eight eight to nine hours a day, depending on what time we leave. Usually our trips leave by nine o'clock and they're back by five o'clock. You know, it's interesting. When we were talking about putting this presentation to, uh, together, you guys, um, I was I talked to Pam, uh, my executive assistant, and I didn't know this, but she goes, oh yeah, I go on these trips all the time. Yeah. And uh, she absolutely loves it. So. Yeah, I've gotten to know Pam very well over the years. And yeah. enjoy having her on the trips. Yeah. Oh yeah, go ahead, uh, Councilor Hunter. Uh, how often are the travel scholarships used? Uh, fairly often. Uh, there are, I don't know specifically individuals that are that qualify, um, but I know quite a few of our seniors are low income and qualify for our reduced rate and our, our scholarships. Is there any way I could get the percentage of, the, of how many, what percentage of people on the trips are using the scholarships so I could share with the senior commission? Because we, this actually came up at our last meeting about um, talking to you about scholarships for the events at senior events at the uh, community center because they there's a cost factor that is holding some of our seniors back yeah i will try to get those numbers for you okay i know it's handled more on the community side side of the things of the, our operation and our front desk staff but i will definitely try to track down those numbers for you Thanks. all right provide it to the whole council too please i will just so we all have it right. sure all right exactly um council president Coach thank Wall. you mayor so david um for those people who are watching from home mm -hmm. uh where do they find this information out, or how can they find out about that? Yeah, trip? thank you for asking. That's another reminder. We've got a couple different things. We have a, a catalog that comes out three times a year. It's on a trimester basis. It's our Parks and Recreation Guide that we put out, um, and we've continued to update that. It looks more like a magazine now instead of a traditional black and white catalog. A lot of great pictures and, and things like that in it. Uh, in addition to that, we have some rack cards that we provide for just our trips and some of our other highlighted programs that we provide each time the catalog comes out. And then I've got some great news on working with our graphics coordinator uh, where we'll be offering even more marketing pieces um, that we'll be getting out throughout the community um, in the fall. And your website. And the website as well, of course. It all happens here at .org. Or dot .org. Easy to remember. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Council, anything else? Uh, Council Member Sefada. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Council Member Dovey and Council Member Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, my, qu my question is um, you mentioned that between 5 a.m. and 2 p.m., mm -hmm. The majority of our clientele are seniors, and so what? Capa what is the capa How many people is that on average, and how much more capacity do we have if people decided, hey, I want to take advantage of the programs? Sure, uh, we have about 500 people coming through the doors uh, between every day? those hours. Yeah, every day. See, and those are just seniors. That's just the senior yeah. population that's coming through the doors. We've got about 100 people coming to pickleball. Anywhere between 100 and 150 coming through the doors just for pickleball. Monday through Friday. They usually arrive between, we offer pickleball starting at 7 a.m. The majority of the group comes between the hours of 8 and 11. Uh -huh. Some of the younger players show up a little bit later than that. And then we've got an extensive, uh, uh, our pool, uh, between all of our, all our classes in the pool, and then our lunch programs as well, and then our group fitness classes upstairs. Yeah. So our, our capacity for, we are actually always looking to add more programming when we can. Um, Hannah Thayer, who does all of our well, fitness. Well, not so much more programming. Mm -hmm. But the capacity, I mean, how many more people could come play pickleball? Are we maxed at 100? Or if 20 more people came in, would we be able to handle it? We'd be able to handle it. It all depends on when they're showing up. That's why our hours, we extended our hours. They used to be from 7 to noon. Yeah. And we extended an additional two hours. And so that hopefully throughout that time frame, we didn't have 100 people showing up all at once. They kind of sporadically show up throughout the morning. We've got different groups that come in at certain times. And, and the last question. When you get to be a senior and you get Medicare, 
you get insurance, you get the riders, and it usually has silver sneakers on it. Yep. Do you have any statistics of how many people actually in our community, their seniors, would have silver sneakers and don't use it? We do. I, I don't have the most latest numbers, but the last time we did, we, we were always looking to do community outreach and figure out who's not utilizing their pass. They'll come in, they'll sign up for the silver sneakers program, and then we might not see them for you know, once or twice over a two-month period. Right. So we, we provide calls, find out what's going on, find out what we can do to get them in the facility because it's, it's enhancing their, their lives and, and, and you know, it helps the community center as well. Yeah. The reason I ask that question, we always get asked for more senior center things, but it seems like we have one of the biggest ones around. We do. And many people just aren't using it. It's being used. and, well, and, we, and five, Only 500. Don't we have like 13,000 seniors in our community was the census that I've heard up here before, something like that? Statistically, that sounds it, right. And they probably, many of them probably have silver sneakers and could take advantage Qualify of Qualify for it, but don't know. Yeah, we are always trying to let them know. And there's, it's not just silver sneakers. There's about five other insurance-based programs that allow them to have a membership at our facility. So we're always looking to, I, I go out and, and talk to numerous retirement communities in the area to let them know about those opportunities that they're missing out on or to get them in our facility. Um, to, to go back to the, the space in our facility, you were asking more at where we were at capacity and things like that. Our pickleball program is kind of maxed out at this point, you know, with 100 to 150 coming through the doors. Um, but we're always looking to add new things and, and, and shift things around the schedule if we can. But at the same time, we want to provide programs throughout the whole, for people throughout the whole community as well. Um, but during those hours in our fitness classes upstairs, those are at capacity, and that's why we've extended and are offering more classes after the lunch hour, because a lot of them end around the lunch hour. We're going to be offering some more classes throughout the summer after the lunch hour into the early afternoon hours, just because the program has continued, continued to grow. And our numbers are up. We've, we're, I think, at our highest membership all time right now at the community center. Wow, that's great. Thank you. Council Member Seba Dawson. Oh, okay. That's where I'm going. Um, thank you. So I have two more questions. Sure. I've, I've been asked uh, if the locker rooms, if, if the portable locker rooms are accessible or if, if they're there yet. They are. Yep. They've been there for about two weeks now. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. And for the senior lunches, uh, so we have the two Korean lunches and the Hispanic lunch. Mm -hmm. uh, I have been asked by seniors and the senior commission has discussed this on the days that the that those are not being served could other lunches be served for for other people because not everyone feels comfortable going to those lunches yeah we've looked in that into that as well uh the biggest thing is funding that, that comes with that our lunches the evergreen senior program provides all the funding for that program and then catholic community services provides all the funding for our friday lunch and catholic community services in fact just lost about 30 percent of their funding this past year and had to scale back at all the other surrounding centers in the area. And so it's very hard to ask them to provide, provide more or a traditional lunch. We only have two other days to possibly do it. It'd be a Monday or Wednesday. Right. And typically on those days, we use that space to do uh, community rentals and things like that in our community rooms. Okay, I, I can see an issue with that. I, maybe we can talk further about that. Or you could come to the Senior Commission because that has come up several times. Sure. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, David, great work, or as they say, Schmitty. Uh, thank you, uh, great work. As uh, those who know you, I refer to you as. John, doing a great job. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Right, thanks, Schmitty. Okay. Yeah. Great job. Okay, uh, now, um, thanks, Brian. Oh. Bill, you want to get us all set up? Now we're on to uh, recent community events and the final results of the 2024 March of Diapers Drive. And um, everyone's favorite friend of Federal Way, Cheryl Hurst. Come on down, Cheryl. Yes. Third slide. There we go. All right, Cheryl, welcome. Uh, thank you, Mayor Farrell and City Council and uh, people in the audience. Well, it was the 10th year, and we were lucky to have a phenomenal turnout at March 23rd at the Twin Lakes Fred Meyer 
kudos to uh, Mike, the manager there. He had everything all set up and we uh, we had every door manned and womaned. Um, so so you couldn't really get in or out the door without us saying, hi, hey, would you like to buy di diapers or wipes um, or adult briefs? Well, drum roll, the Federal Way beat their, their last numbers. They did 15,001 diapers um, at the, at the uh, Fred Meyer event. Um, and to kind of pull the full numbers together, uh, which is much smaller than last year, but you know what I gotta say? Things have changed in our world and there's still a lot of phenomenal people out there. Last year we did 412,125 diapers. This year we did 280,725 diapers and 151,780 wipes. And I think that's something to be said for people out there that you know are struggling in multiple ways but are still putting their stuff, their, their time and their money out there. Um, there was just, we had so much help this year. It's like, I'll just say it was the easiest year ever, um, except for the fact that we had to go up a flight of stairs to, to do our diapers. But um, kudos to Jim Farrell. He was the first one to come out of the store with a box of diapers. Um, I wanted him to wear, you know, a diaper outfit, but, you know, 10 years, I've, I've tried. It looks like it's not going to happen, but we'll talk about it later on. Um, the other thing I wanted to let you guys know is uh, everybody's like, oh, so, like, well, what about next year? Well, the, we're not going to do the big March of Diapers drive next year. Uh, this was kind of the finale. Um, it doesn't mean that there can't be a March of Diapers drive. Um, most people don't know that there's uh, 80 businesses in 15 cities that we're collecting. So that's a lot of dropping off and a lot of picking up. And um, I got to give finally some credit to my husband who has taken time off of work Yay. and done, you know, followed me like nobody's business on. He just says, where do you want me next? So, you know, kudos to my husband. Thank you, John. Um, but we do have what's called the March of Diapers, Babies, and Beyond Diaper Bank. So people are like, what in the heck is a diaper bank? Do you throw money in there? Well, you can throw money, you can throw diapers in there. But we are actually located um, in a building behind Lowe's, and it is a full, all year long diaper bank. So what happens with that is we will be working with selected nonprofits in the next couple of months. Um, so we won't be just handing diapers out to the public but we will still be collecting diapers, collecting open packages of diapers, um, adult briefs, which people don't understand, disposable briefs, so that's like Depends, Tana, other different versions like that. We do take open packages, and what will happen is throughout the year, um, quarterly, we'll be working through um, maybe doing some public events, but you know, so you gotta, you gotta crawl before you walk, and that's where we're at right now. We are having a gala June 8th. Um, we've managed to do 10 years with, uh, with pretty much no funding and the grace of, of people being kind. But uh, now we actually have rent and we have a diaper director that will be starting May 1st. So if you'd like to get dressed up June 8th and, uh, and come to our gala, it's going to be at the fabulous uh, Federway Community Center. And thank you for providing that you guys it's awesome i mean we're paying for it but thank you for providing because it's this is like home um beyond that if anybody has any questions they can look on facebook under march of diapers or they can look on my personal page which is cheryl cole hurst if they have any questions or they want to volunteer um jim still really wants to wear the diaper outfit so we'll just have to talk about that i'm just thinking of what we can do we can negotiate how about your next birthday? It's coming up in <laughs> September. We'll talk about it. Anyways, I'm grateful for everybody here because I guess the, the last number I haven't uh, said is we're just barely shy of in this 10 years we've given out th almost just short of 3 million diapers. Wow. So, I mean, 3 million diapers, that's a lot of people. Um, we've served anywhere from five nonprofits 20 nonprofits last year, 17 nonprofits this year. So, like I said, there's a lot of really gracious, um, generous people out there, and and uh, I just appreciate everything that everybody's done for us. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. And thank you, John.
Great job, really impactful to our community, and thank you uh, for really caring about uh, many in our community. Okay, uh, next, uh, we, uh, these are uh, recent community events. We had the Fusion Groundbreaking uh, last Thursday, April 11th. Um, uh, it's always great to uh, see, boy, Fusion just does just tremendous work in our community. Um, they, uh, it's right there off, uh, just, just uh, uh, south of 312th on 13th, uh, just west of uh, Pacific Highway. They, uh, there had been a house that Fusion bought, it burned down, but it, it actually, the silver lining was, gave them a chance, uh, it's going to give them a chance to build back up, be, uh, put two duplexes there, and uh, bring their 24th and 25th uh, residences in our community. Yeah, that's, it's a big deal. Um, Boy, they're doing great work, and we really appreciate them. It was great to see so many members of the community there. Uh, you see the picture in the middle, um, and what's a, uh, the, uh, uh, the Washington State History. It was Washington State History Week at Sequoia Middle School, April 9th through 11th. Uh, Dave, I think it was uh, about seven classes that I taught. One day, I taught seven, uh, you know, hour-long classes. Uh, one day, I did four classes in one day, and I, I got to, I've got a newfound appreciation for uh, teachers. I was exhausted at the end of the day. My wife says, what's, what's wrong? And I'm like, I, I'm exhausted after teaching four hours at school. I, I don't know how our teachers do it every day. They're really the unsung heroes in our community. A uh, lot of great questions. It was really, there was a seventh grade. Uh, I went to every seventh grade class there. Uh, a lot of fun, uh, great teachers, great students, great questions. It was an honor to be there. And uh, so, um, uh, a lot of fun, and those are some pictures. Uh, so then uh, we had the Federal Korean American Association open house uh, April 11th, right? That's right down the street at 333rd and 1st on the west hand side there. Um, they, uh, they're celebrating, the Korean Association is celebrating their 15th year uh, and the new office space, and uh, we're really looking forward to the launching of the Hanrui Garden. Uh, it's going to be right there, essentially, between the Little League on 348th on Campus Drive, um, between the Little League ball fields and the King County Aquatic Center, um, and that's in the works right now. Um, and I, I believe they're hoping by end of summer, right? Uh, sometime in summer to, to get that. And um, um, Hanrui in Korean means we're all one together. And I think that there's a, uh, there's a lot of power in that phrase. And you can see that picture, um, uh, many members of the community there um, uh, for uh, that great event. Okay, uh, also um, the uh, picture right there uh, to the bottom left actually occurred this Monday where we uh, were there for the grand opening, the very first day in ribbon cutting on April 15th of Federway Audiology. And uh, that's right there across the street um, uh, from Federway Public Academy, just south of, it's on 9th Avenue, just south of where the uh, hospital is and the Wells Fargo Bank. So they're right in there uh, helping individuals with hearing issues and making sure they get the help they need. Um, all right, uh, upcoming issues. We've got the upcoming community events. Um, uh, we've got the Federway, uh, Federway Little League Jamboree. Uh, that's this coming Saturday, April 20th, 9 a.m. That's the Federway National, League, uh, Federway National Little League Complex. Um, and it's great to see all the teams in their uniforms, and, and uh, it really is. It's, uh, it's just absolutely fantastic. And uh, um, let's see, Parks Appreciation Day, Saturday, same day, on uh, uh, April 20th, 9 a.m. to noon. Uh, there'll be two locations, uh, one down at the Brook Lake uh, uh, Blueberry Farm. That's right there um, at uh, Brook Lake, um, uh, right in that area off of 356th, and as well as Sahali Park, uh, adjacent, immediately adjacent to Sahali Junior High. And that's 9 a.m. to noon. And then we've got the I'm Hooked on Fishing event on May 4th, Steel Lake, 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, should be a great event. And then uh, uh, soon we'll be talking about the launching or the opening of the Federway Farmers Market. That's going to be happening on Saturday, May 11th, uh, which is very important because that's always where I buy uh, the, and they better have good flowers this year, and they always do. Uh, but that's where I get the Mother's Day flowers uh, for Wendy and her mother. So. Uh, all right, well now, uh, uh, let's talk about the, uh, the most important part of the evening, which is to hear from the people that we work for, uh, which is you. Uh, why don't I name the folks off? Um, keep in mind, um, <clears throat> the council would like to know what community you live in. Uh, if, you're, if you live in Federway, we don't need your address, we don't need your neighborhood. Uh, but if you live in Federway, uh, just let us know. Uh, it'd, be, it'd be great to know. Um, also, you've got three minutes. Green means go, yellow means you've got about 30 seconds. Uh, red means please stop, and I don't like interrupting people, um, as you likely know. Okay, so um, uh, these are the speakers, and if you could uh, 
uh, uh, queue up here so where we could uh, get you know, we can go through these uh, efficiently. First, we're going to have Ron Walker, then um, Ann Blevins, then Susan Strong, Anna Patrick, Salim uh, Critchy, uh, Evigny Rocco, Trinice Rogers, Betty Taylor, and Ken Blevins. All right, with that, Ron. My name is Ron Walker. I've lived in Federal Way for a very long time. And I also was on the board with uh, Mr. Dovey putting together the, the uh, community center. So um, I moved here in 1986, bought my first house. I was 26 years old. And when I bought my house, I promised myself I was going to buy myself a little maple tree. And I lived in the house for 19 years, never bought the maple tree. When I sold that house and bought my next house, I went out to Fernie's and bought myself a maple tree. And I bought it home, and I put it where the guy told me to put it, and that's when I know the guy didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> because I moved it over close to the house, and it was perfect. It was sitting out in the middle of the, out in the middle yard, and I'm like, nah, that looks deaky. So I moved it next to the house, and I looked at it, and I was like, perfect. Dug a hole, put it in there. And what I didn't realize is how big a little maple tree would grow in 20 years. When I brought it home, it had a little base like that. Now it's got a base like that. It's 20 feet tall. It's a beautiful maple. But I'm going to have to cut that maple down because now the roots are going underneath my house because they didn't plan for how big a maple tree was going to grow. Better Way is going to grow here in a minute. It's about to pop. And the market, the, a, um, the park that we have right now, that little town square park is going to be too small in about 20 years. I am proposing again that we do not sell TC3, but we use TC3 as a beautiful, large park for our city. What you hold in your hands are two divergent futures. If you look at it, one is a future under the current path. It shows all the different type of buildings that are going to be built in Federal Way. Probably most of the stuff that's going to be built is going to be mixed-use mid-rises. And you can see that it swallows up that little tiny park. It turns into like a little That's what it ends up with when you have 15,000 new people moving into downtown. My proposal then is that we take TC3, do not sell it, use it as a, small par as a larger park, with a component that also has an economic engine to it. You can see that that is how this downtown is going to look. So that's my proposal. I've talked to you guys about it probably now for two years. Um, you could talk to Mr. Niven and, and, and determine whether or not I'm right on or right off and what the future is going to look like, whether or not downtown, the comprehensive plan calls for uh, mid-rise buildings. But I, I'm, I'm strongly encouraging you not to sell the property. It's, it would be better for the city, for the people, all the way around, if we retained it as a park. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. All right, Ann Blevins. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. <laughs> Um, our mayor and our president of the city council and all the rest of you. Um, I have a, I came to find out what's going on here. There's this, on 304, 304th, yeah, and, uh, and Pacific Highway South, I found, uh, it's actually on uh, 16th Avenue there, on the corner there, there was a sign. I don't think it was a, regular sign it it was written by somebody and and stuck in the ground it was uh, um, about this big and then and um, I didn't understand what it meant because it talked about going from some kind of unused property from um, Pacific Highway South 
um, between 308 and 3, 288, and uh, I don't think there was anything that I could find, and it wouldn't go through in um, intersections. So what would it be? Does anybody know? Well, uh, uh, Ms. Blevins, go ahead and tell us uh, all, everything you, uh, and then what we'll do is we'll get information uh, to you once you're all done. Today, it, um, I, I went, yesterday and today I went and looked for it again so I could be sure that um, if it was had got in the wrong place or the right place. And um, I don't want you guys to vote on, on it unless we, until, I was going to put a sign on it that said, please, I will think about it when you walk us through this so we know what we're talking, what you're talking about. And... Um, so that didn't work <laughs> um, because the sign disappeared a couple of days ago, and I was afraid that they took it to, to you, you folks, and, and we don't know what it was about, or, and we wouldn't know if, it, if we really wanted it. If, if it was there, there was a reason for it. A re it re actually, when we first saw it, it was on the wrong side of the, the street here and in the, in the wrong direction, pointed in the wrong direction. So. I turned it around so we could see it on this side, but uh, that wasn't very helpful either. So could you explain it to me? <laughs> Will do. Are you done? Yep. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you, Ms. Blevins. Uh, Keith, uh, do you have any information about this? Um, I, I do not. Um, so I will chat with Ann, figure out where the sign was, and I will get uh, back in touch with her tomorrow. Sounds like the, the sign was initially on the west side of Peck Highway. Could it be uh, what we're doing over there with the pathway, EJ? No, we don't have any signage out there like this. All right, Ms. Blevins, we will, we're will. we going to track this down for you. And uh, uh, Keith, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Keith, our community development director, uh, who is in charge of uh, you know development and permitting and all that, uh, we're going to get down to the bottom of this. And uh, it may just require us to go out there and take a look at what you're looking at, and, and we'll, do work, we'll do everything we can to figure it out. Okay, thank you very much. Susan Strong. Every time you say Susan, I think it's me. Exactly. That's right. It's such a great name. You don't hear it very often. Mayor Farrell, Council President Coachmar, Council Members. I'm Susan Strong, and I live in Federal Way since 1975. The other day we had an opportunity to change out our old faded American flag and I brought it with me. You could see it's quite faded. We've traded it in for a new larger flag. Since this is a strenuous task, we ask our Ukrainian neighbor to help us with it. I explained to him that when we take the old flag down, we cannot let it touch the ground and it must be folded in a certain way before it is recycled. It's ready to be uh, the only word I can think of is recycled. When we got the flag down, I read the directions to the two guys to fold it in half lengthwise, then fold it into triangle shape so that the blue background with the white stars is all that shows, just like how we did. The only way to completely retire a flag is to burn it or bury it. It's never thrown away in the garbage. And I explained all this to Alex. He had never heard any of this. He was brought here as a young child. He's now a US citizen, but he took all of this in. I was just flabbergasted at how respectful he was of the whole process. So that's why I wanted to share it with you that some of our new people, I learned this when I was in Girl Scouts as a, a young girl. and. We never even practiced, but we were told about the respect of a flag and what it stands for, the freedom that we have. And I will never take that freedom for granted. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. So, um, Susan, you can take the flag to the Boy Scouts and they will. Yeah. And uh, Councilor Walsh? I, I was uh, just going to comment. Thank you, Susan, very much. And uh, that, that's something I learned as a Boy Scout is the proper way to fold a flag and, and uh, dispose of it. Uh, but I know that it used to be that in the city of Auburn, they had a, a place outside the city hall where you could put flags and, and then later on the Boy Scouts would take them and, and dispose of them in the, the proper manner. Hmm. And perhaps that's something that we 
could consider here at, at our city hall so that people know where they can take a flag to, That's great. Uh, to uh, dispose of respect. Well, I know some diaper um, boxes <laughs> that need to be recycled. <laughs> well, um, Bill, uh, can you uh, uh, call city of, uh, I was actually just on a conference call with the, with the mayor of Auburn yesterday. We talk all the time. We'll reach out tomorrow. Yeah, I, I, I don't know whether they still have it, but a number of years ago they, they, they did, and they and, may very well still may. And, you know, they've got the, the longest standing veterans parade. They just do, they do Auburn does, does such great service uh, to their veterans. Uh, we'll reach out to them tomorrow. Um, I know that just to let you, Susan, just to let you know, we've, we've got a thing here at the city that if we see a, if we see a flag around town that's torn or worn or looks like it needs replacing, Bill uh, has delivered flags around this community and businesses to make sure uh, that they look fresh and clean. So thank you very much, I think. But that we're going we're gonna to call Auburn tomorrow, and uh, uh, because of your comment, we may just uh, do exactly what's being suggested here. So thank you. All right. Okay, Anna Patrick. Good evening, Mayor, Council President, and Council Public. Uh, my name is Anna Patrick. I've been, I've lived in the city for a number of years, and um, I'm here tonight uh, to talk about a few things. Um, first of all, um, I just want to raise a concern about what was just proposed for TC3. Um, I thought tonight was the second hearing, and so I kind of feel like this is a circumventing of a process uh, when you're handed plans of something completely different uh, that the public can't see, and you're making decisions on that. Uh, after our legislative uh, group just handed money over to the ones that are proposing this. And um, it seems to me a way of gaining control over the decisions of the city. Uh, I caution you in making decisions on that. Um, I, on a, the same note, uh, making decisions on behalf of the city, uh, a, a group of us have been looking at records um, from the city um, for youth action team and grants and Kai Franciscan and uh, various other nonprofit groups that have received funding from our city, from King County, from a variety of other funding sources and have collaborated together um, outside of uh, the decision making of the city in my opinion. It hasn't really followed the public process from what I can see. I haven't thoroughly looked at it but I'm suspicious of um, uh, conflicts of interest and um, proper process of decision making in some cases. Uh, so the critical incident response um, proposal, it looks like uh, at one point during 2020, the city, or the city didn't contract with them, but Kai Franciscan did. Now, um, we had a violence prevention coalition. I don't believe that was part of the decision to sort of take over the police role and and so, so this was sort of proposed that it would be sort of built into uh, the policing and sort of substituting it in some cases from what I can see. Uh, I haven't been able to verify just how much of this is playing out in our city, but uh, in light of the crime downgrading and things that we're seeing, um, it does make me wonder, it, 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 I'm just trying to make sense of all this and it's not making sense. And so trying to put this all together, it's definitely um, raising some questions. Uh, so uh, we'll be sending more emails your way and uh, hopefully putting, putting this all together so we can kind of understand it. Thank you. I would just also caution if you're going to be accepting any grant proposals to require um, documentation, uh, data collection, really good data collection. I'd like to just make it clear, I support grants when they're nonprofits, when they're doing good work, because I know they do good work, and they have good intentions, but I, I think we should collect data so we can show the success, not just the failures. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Patrick. Um, I am not aware of any, any funding uh, to organizations that, has gone, that have gone beyond the normal process of committee and council and all that. So uh, would you, uh, uh, Keith Niven, um, uh, in human services, just uh, communicate with Sarah. I think that we had received a, a, an inquiry about this at the last meeting, um, and we looked into uh, we, we looked into whether there was any connection with the city in some of this. I, I, we did the Violence Prevention Coalition 
after a, a number of homicides in 2016, eight years ago, but that was a, just a short duration uh, community get together. But I, uh, we'll look into these concerns. Uh, with regard to uh, any, we don't downgrade crimes uh, inappropriately in the city of Federal Way, Ms. Patrick. Uh, Deputy Chief Sumter, can you explain? Well, with the, uh, we've had conversations this week about uh, 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 wild accusations on social media posts about how we classified certain things and something over at Steel Lake Park and how that, how that played out. Would you explain all that? Sure. It's very detailed and complex. I wonder if we might entertain an explanation at the end of citizen comment uh, we're, so I don't interrupt their, the, we the people's momentum. That's okay. All right. No, no, I mean, let's do it now. Oh, do it now. Yeah. All right. Let me start by, instead of addressing individual crimes, because there's many crimes that occur every day, and uh, in recent emails, we received a list of, or a reference to, 70 cases that were brought to our attention quite some time ago, and more recently, 22 cases, and then again, eight cases. And rather than deal with individual incidents, let me try to explain it with a couple of hypotheticals. First of all, if we compare crime statistics to cement, we're going to have a very inaccurate comparison because we wait for cement to cure before we build something on it, build a theory on it, build a bridge on it, whatever. And unlike cement, which cures and becomes very solid, Crime numbers are never settled. They are never written in stone. For instance, uh, we had the crime that has been referenced a couple of times tonight that occurred at IHOP a few days ago. When that incident first occurred, the crime coding would have been aggravated assault. But within a few days, the child very sadly passed away. And so the crime coding changed to a homicide. And hypothetically, if somebody is shot and dies from that injury two years later, we would go back to crime statistics from two years previously and change those statistics to reflect the emerging incident, the change in the incident. So you might see published crime statistics from two years ago, written on paper, so written in stone, and then ask for the crime statistics today and get a different number because the crime numbers are never cured. They're never settled. There's always a little bit of variance that goes along the way. Now let me give you an example, a hypothetical situation that might help explain a gap between how we code offenses and how others of our friends in this community want us to code offenses. Let's say a nice person gets up in the morning to go to work and she walks outside and she finds her car, her personally owned vehicle outside with the driver's window smashed. She calls the police, the police show up, and we start taking a report. Now, we know that a lot of auto thefts begin with, or at least some auto thefts begin with a broken window in order to gain entry. Now, if we adopted the philosophy that we are going to initially code all crimes with the highest possible crime, then we're going to code that broken window as a, an attempted auto theft, right? Knowing that not all broken windows are actually attempted auto thefts. But if we're going with possible, the highest possible crime that we're going to call all broken car windows an auto theft to begin with. But let's say by investigation, we start to snoop around a little bit. We find a surveillance video, but this might be even the next day and an officer might write up attempted auto theft because there's a broken window. That's the highest possible crime. And that goes in, but a couple of days later, somebody comes forward and says, I've got surveillance video from my ring camera, and let's watch that, let's show it to the police, and we see her ex-boyfriend drove up at 2 a.m., he parked his truck, he looked around, he got out, he ran up there with a baseball bat, smashed the window out, ran, jumped into his truck, and drove off. There was no attempted auto theft there, that is a straight-up malicious mischief. So we're going to go back and 
downgrade the crime. Right? We're going to change the code to more accurately reflect what actually happened, only knowable by ongoing investigation. And so these codings change. Now let's go back to the, the, the ask that we code initially with the possible highest crime. We don't adopt that philosophy. And therein lies a gap. The philosophy we start with is, what is the most provable crime? What's the highest provable crime based on the evidence we have now? So there is a gap between highest possible and highest provable. And without getting into a great deal of more explanation and of that sort of thing, I'll just leave you with that and with this invitation. For those who are interested, and we appreciate your interest, come and see us. Come and meet with me and the person who handles, the person who is an, our expert on statistics. Meet with us, and let's talk about it, and we'll go through some cases, and we'll show you exactly why we coded the way we did. And if you catch us in a mistake, and we look at it, and upon examination, we agree that we made a mistake, we will change it. Thank you. Okay. There was a there was a uh, uh, somebody who showed up um, allegedly at Steel Lake Park this weekend. It's reported it was with an AR assault rifle. Can you talk about how that got reported and why? Sure. That was simply an unfinished case report. The officer who, in quick summary, very nice day out there on Sunday over the weekend. Uh, some people who were assembled together probably had too much to drink. Although drinking in the park is illegal. And they started to square off with each other, and it broke out into a fight that spread and got into a big fight. And so as this, these two groups fought it out, somebody went to their car, got a gun, came out and pointed it at people, and everybody said, whoa, 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 whoa. And they stopped fighting. And they said, ooh, the cops are going to come now. Everybody jumped to their cars and drove off, or nearly everybody got in their cars and drove off. So by the time the, uh, and, and the vehicle that had the gun get in it and drive off had removed the plates. So we're not able to track down a vehicle license plate, but we had a description. So while some officers came into the park to talk to witnesses and see if anybody else, any victims, anybody injured, et cetera, other police were out looking for this vehicle that fled with a gun in it. That vehicle wasn't located, and inside the park, we found no victims of the gun pointing. So we had neither suspects nor victims. We did have witnesses. Is it a real gun? We don't know. Was it an airsoft gun? We don't know because we never found the gun. So there we go. We, now we're starting to get back to highest possible or highest provable. In a nutshell, the officer who was there writing the report was there on overtime, backfilling for an absent officer. It was his regular day off. At the end of the shift, after taking other case reports on other incidents, the supervisor said, look, you're already here on overtime. Nobody was arrested, nobody was found, nobody was injured. You can finish that case tomorrow. Now there's already information that has automatically dumped from our CAD dispatch system, automatically dumped into our record keeping system, Spillman. And from there, crime mapping automatically populates. Whether it's finished or not, whether it's verified or not, whether it's approved or not, the information that is there at the time of population gets populated. Like I said, these numbers are never set in stone. So this is unfinished, unapproved, unreviewed reporting numbers popping out there for the public to see. And uh, th that number was noted along with the type of information that was associated with the dispatch. And it was improperly coded initially. And that generated the email and some controversy. But subsequently, that officer came back to work the next day Finish the report based on the investigation. As the report was finished, the, co the coding was changed to reflect the incident. Then it went through for supervisory approval. It went then to our NIBRS crime reporting person for verification. And then the coding that the new coding was verified and it's currently in place that way. So this was simply a misunderstanding of timing. There was an initial mistake on the draft preliminary entry, and that was subsequently changed. All right, thank you. 
Okay, uh, next uh, public comment, Salim Critchie. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Thank you for recognizing me. Uh, my name is Salim Krishi. I'm a student at St. Petersburg College, and I study public policy. And uh, I'm here to voice my support for the allocation of funds to the SKIP housing uh, fund. And um, as we all know, the, the rate of homelessness in the Pacific Northwest is one of the highest in the region. And so any kind of projects that go towards um, alleviating those kinds of issues are things that I really think that we should uh, push for. And I'm originally from the state of Florida, I've, uh, and I'm still in school back home. And I've been in the Pacific Northwest now for a couple of years, and most of that time I've lived here in Federal Way. And I, I've, I've felt this constant sense of uneasiness out here. Um, it just, it's the, the, the environment that I, I have found myself in has not been easy to navigate. Um, I've been working in security for the vast majority of time that I've been here, um, here in Federal Way, in Seattle, in Tacoma. I've, uh, I've worked uh, with Amazon. I've worked in the, the, the Pierce County Courthouse. I've done a variety of work. And there is this very much lingering feeling of of uneasiness that I feel uh, when 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 I'm when I'm out here. And as as someone who as someone who is thinking about the future and starting a family and settling down, those are very big concerns for me. And you know, many in the community um, are are always are always wondering. You know what? What are our public officials doing to address these issues? These very serious issues of crime, homelessness, and things of that nature. And I also understand very much that engagement at the local level is very difficult. Um, it's it's very hard to get people to um, you know take advantage of resources and to come out and to do things. And um, and that that's not that's not uh, lost on me. But. Um, you know, I was I was here uh, during the last meeting, and th there were also concerns about where where the funding is going, where it's going, what the county is doing, and there it didn't seem like that everyone was on the same page as far as what was happening, and and that concerns me. And Skip doesn't have any projects currently in federal way either, which is uh, something to be to be addressed. So, those are uh, those are my concerns, and uh, those are concerns that many people here have, and um, so. You know, for me, I, I just don't know if I have a future in the state of Washington, and all these people deserve better. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, <clears throat> okay, I, um, Ebony Rocco. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Ebony. Ebony. Rocco? It, it uh, says topic, major cleanup of federal way. So if... Um, uh, we're working on cleaning it up. Uh, if Mr. and Mrs. Rocco has any uh, suggestions, please let us know. Um, if you see anybody else come in, see if they're uh, Evino you know, Rocco. Trinice Rogers, and then Betty Taylor. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Trinice Rogers. I'm a resident of Federal Way. I want to elevate um, today the black Wellness Week. I wanted to read this article I found in Tacoma Weekly, uh, Breaking New Ground in the Realm of Equity and Health Advocacy. The government, the governor instantly has issued a proclamation during Black History Month announcing the inaugural Black Wellness Week is scheduled for observation um, from April 15th through the 19th. This historic proclamation not only marks a significant milestone for black history in Washington State, but also symbolizes a bold commitment to addressing the unique health disparities faced by the black community. Throughout history, the black community has encountered syst systemic barriers to wellness, including uh, unequal access to health care, discriminatory practices, and uh, socioeconomic 
uh, disparities. The COVID-19 pandemic further exacerbated these disparities. Uh, with the black individual experiencing disproportionately higher rates of infection, severe illness, and mortality. Leading the charge in this remarkable moment in black history and catalyzing the uh, Elevate Black Wellness Initiative is Momentum Professional Strategy Partners, uh, Black-owned diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility consulting firm. Uh, that's just want to just note that referring to Mr. Blocker, who recently um, accepted the proclamation earlier today with his wife. In addition to that, I wanted to share that this initiative was born out of a dire need to address health disparities stands as a testament to the impactful role that black-owned businesses play in driving societal advancements. Uh, Mr. Black, uh, Mr. Keith Blocker, former city council member and CEO of Momentum Strategy or Professional Strategy Partners, emphasized the significance of the proclamation. He also stated that Black Wellness Week is a critical acknowledgement in Washington State of the, pres of the pressing needs to addressing health, health disparities in black communities. Inspired by historical advocates like Booker T. Washington, it marks a beginning in our focused journey toward health equity. Unquote. And uh, Ms. Christina quote, uh, Ms. Christina Blocker, she quoted also, which is also the founder of Momentum Professional Strategy Partners, she echoed this sentiment in stating, acknowledging, an acknowledgement is the first step towards addressing systemic disparities that have long plagued our communities. Black Wellness Week not only honors our history, but also propels us towards a future of, inequitable, of equitable health care for each one of the communities. In addition to that, I also wanted to share how um, Agape Children and Family Wellness Center, which is a new founding organization here in Federal Way, which is also nonprofit, um, their mission statement is restoring, preserving, and elevating the lives of black children and families. We will be hosting a certified mental health first aid um, certification here in the community. And so the, part, the participants will also gain knowledge in the areas of mental health that will impact their communities as well as their families and their peers. And as we talk about how to counter is that it? You can finish, Trace. Okay. Go ahead. And I just want to share, as we talk about how do we counter black wellness and what does that look like in our community and the things that people have experienced in our community, um, when, you si when you're silent in the wake of public um, anti-black attacks, that's counter black wellness. When you see black men experiencing false arrests and unlawful and unlawful arrest and den denying black men access to personal belongings like cell phones, uh, vehicle keys, or even just food when they're in the presence of our police department. That's what we call black, uh, that's what you call it, countering black wellness. So when we talk about how as a community, how can we counter, or how can we elevate black wellness, um, just really highlighting the things that are happening to our black people in our community and just really addressing those issues, that's how us as a community can counter or can elevate black wellness. Thank you. Thank you, Trinice, and thank you for your service on our Diversity Commission. Uh, Betty Taylor. <clears throat> Excuse me, everybody. Hi, Betty. <clears throat> okay, so first I want to ask, I want to, okay, my name is Betty Taylor. Can everybody hear me? Can you hear me through this mask? Yes. Okay, because I've been told by two people that can't hear me. Okay, so my name is Betty Taylor. Okay, justice for my grandson, Ezra Taylor, I did put in Jesus' name. He had visions, goals, and dreams, but because of one mistake made at the hands of someone else, he's not with us anymore. Everything changes. Our family mourns every single day, and more so with this trial, murder trial, more, more so with this trial, uh, Mm, excuse me. It's like we're relieving everything all over again. Victims and families of gun violence need justice. Taking away guns from violators needs to happen. But where do they obtain these guns? They are either stolen or they are bought at a gun store or pawn shop or maybe even stolen or bought from an acquaintance. Who knows? But whatever and however, this has to stop. When will cities across the nation wake up to this issue of gun violence, which impacts us, impacts so many. Get involved in organizations that are against gun violence. Let your voice be heard. Do something about it. Say something about it. Don't just stand by and watch it happen and turn a deaf ear. But do you know what? People don't usually do anything until it hits their home, and that's when people see action. Well, it's hit my family in the worst possible way. 
that you can imagine, but we aren't suffering alone. We have developed many relationships along the way. We mourn with those who mourn. We walk, side, we walk, oh, excuse me. We walk alongside victims every single day. We pray for victims because going through this ain't no joke. This is not on television. We can't change the channel. We can't even turn back the hands of time. Our loved ones are gone and they are not coming back at all. So here we are in a trial. Murder, murder trial, fighting and advocating and praying that our laws of justice work. So while we are in this journey, continue to pray for us and with us because this is exhausting. And yes, we get tired, but we won't quit. That's not us at all because prayer is our weapon. So we put on the whole armor of God on a daily basis because we win with Jesus and he is in total control. We appreciate our wide and wide people. And if you're listening to Listening to me, you are our right and die people every single day. Um, um, the ones we, we, we're grateful for the ones that call and check on us daily, and they bring us food to eat while we're in court. The one that, who never gives up. My time is up, but justice for Ezra Taylor, that you could text this number to your cell phone, Justice 206 472 We are in a fight for justice for my grandson, and we will not stop. We will not give up. And we thank you for being on this journey with us. You are our ride and die. And I give you a hug. This is a big hug for my ride and die people right here. Because you give me strength. I mean, I, you just give me strength. And I thank you for it. Okay. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. We're praying for you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the last pink sheet I have is Ken Blevins. Uh, hello, uh, Mayor, uh, Council. Uh, thanks for taking my comments. I'm Ken Blevins. I'm from Federal Way, born and raised. And um, what I, I originally wanted to come up here and talk about um, the homeless drug addiction issue that I, and I always talk about it, but there's like specifically out in front of the H Mart, there's probably about 15 or so people that have been hanging out there the last couple days and nights. And um, uh, it wasn't addressed the last couple days at all. Uh, I don't know if um, our SOU unit has access and uh, agreement to make sure we don't have people out there. Um, but there, I think maybe three or four of them panhandling or begging at the doors near there. And people are really uncomfortable about it. Um, the businesses, uh, it's not good for the businesses because people are uncomfortable about it. And then also up uh, closer to the street, um, they're just hanging out there. They're on the sidewalk laying down. They're in between the sidewalk and the street and that little patch of grass, they're laying down there. And I'm just wondering how the heck do we have a patrol? I know I, there are a lot of cops drive by there. How do we not stop and do something about that? Um, why don't we have a homeless coordinator in the city of Federway when we have stuff like this? We're having a, a hotel turn into a, a, um, a, a apartment building for a homeless that are not um, forced to treat for their drug addiction. And they're uh, white males in between probably, I think, age of 20 and, and 30 or 40 or somewhere around there. They said 50 or something like that. That's not true. That's not what we see out on the street. There are some older guys. There's not very many of them. But they're just young kids just uh, lost on drugs and so on, and we're not doing anything about it. Why don't we have a homeless coordinator? There's other jobs I'm sure that we don't need as much. I mean, we're a diverse city already. Why do we need to be more di I mean, we're diverse. That's just how we are. And I went to high school here. We were diverse back then. We've gotten even more diverse, and we've even gotten greater. Why don't we have a homeless coordinator? Because that's something that's most important right now. Drugs, the addiction to drugs, and stuff like that, that's where crime comes from. The fact that our, um, uh, our state leaders, uh, Jamila Taylor and um, Claire Wilson, and uh, I forgot the other ladies, uh, Reeves, that they made laws that downgraded crime and made it so that when you do violent crime that they downgrade it or that we're there, they go to King County and they're not prosecuted. That's the problem. When you have people that go do, do a crime and they end up going to jail or get hard time, that makes other people not want to do that. 
that's how we fight crime, right? So, um, and I'm sorry that Betty has to deal with this. She, she's so good. She's here every week or every um, uh, council meeting fighting for her, uh, her relative, and that's a loss. That's never come back. And it's not a, a necessarily a gun crime in that way. I think that people are more emboldened to go do this crime. We need to find out where these people are coming from because 15 people don't just get dropped off from nowhere. We need to find out where they're from, who's dropping them off, and then stop that from happening. And when we have people here, we take care of them. We help in taking care of them. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. I'll put some thought into your recommendation. Thank you. Uh, Chief, can you um, notify SOU about H Mark? Already underway. <clears throat> I know Commander Jones sitting in the back room heard this. I know he's already working on it. I know him very well. Already underway. Very good. All right. Thank you very much. Stephanie, do we have any other, uh, anybody online or anything? No, I don't have anybody else who signed up. All right. For all those who testified, thank you very much. We very much appreciate it. It's the most important thing we do is to listen to your comments. Okay. Um, item six. <clears throat> Excuse me, everybody. Council Committee and Regional Committee reports. First, Parks, Recreation, Human Services, um, and Safety Committee. Council Member Walsh. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the... The uh, Parks, Recreation, Human Services, and Public Safety Committee met a week ago this evening. Uh, I was out of town and uh, remo re joined remotely part of the time while I was able to have a connection. And I would first like to thank uh, Council Member Lydia Acefa Dawson for chairing that meeting. She did a very, very fine job. And uh, out of that meeting uh, came items J through P on today's consent agenda. So it was a very, very productive meeting. Uh, also, in the Mayor's Emerging Issues Report, there was the reminder that this Saturday, the 20th, is the Parks Appreciation Day. And I cannot speak without reminding people that it is Parks Appreciation Day, uh, be it the parks, the Blueberry Bar Farm Park or Sahali Park from 9 to noon. There are opportunities for people of all abilities to serve the community and help beautify the community and make it a better place. Whether you are old or young or anywhere in between, uh, bring your family out, bring your friends out, bring your neighbors out, and help make Federal Way a better and more beautiful place. Uh, this will be the 18th annual Parks Appreciation Day. Be there. Very and good. I'm talking to the people on the dais also. All right. Uh, All right. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, Land Use Transportation Committee, Councilmember Dovey. Thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Our next meeting will be May 6th, which is a Monday at 5 p.m. here in the council chair uh, chambers. We'll probably be talking a little bit about recreational vehicles. I think that's coming back to have some more discussion, parking in the neighborhoods. And uh, out of our meeting, items B through um, I were all approved in land use. It was a busy <coughs> meeting. And so we'll be passing most of those tonight. Thank you. Um, all right. Thank you very much. Uh, Chairman Tran is not present, so we'll uh, skip over that. Lodging Tax Advisory Committee, Council Member Sepha Dawson. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we'll hear applications for two events seeking grants in the next meeting um, in May, the second Wednesday at 10 a.m. Thank you. Very good. Regional Committee's report, uh, Council Member Honda. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, last week I attended the PIC meeting, and we talked about the public defender caseloads, which apparently they're going to be decreasing their caseloads. Yeah which is going to have an impact on all the cities. Yeah. Uh, and also the emergency medical services levy that is coming in 2025. So we'll have more information on that in, as it gets closer, but every city will be asked for their support for that. Uh, today was a skateboard meeting. We discussed uh, the stride bus rapid transit briefing. Um, so we have the rapid bus here already in Federal Way. I think we were the first ones that got that, and they're building those all over King County. They're, to, they're in places where light rail won't be able to get there, and they're um, treated just like light rail. So you get on the bus, two doors, you pay off, you get on, and uh, they come every 10 to 15 minutes, and uh, they're, they'll be as, uh, all over King County eventually. And um, also PSRC climate overview was discussed today. And letters of support for um, other jurisdictions that are trying to get um, grants for um, projects and how we could as cities support other cities. And um, 
I will be bringing that back to the council, probably to a committee to discuss that, to see how we as a council would like to discuss that. Um, the Chamber of Commerce last week had their, their luncheon and Camp Kilworth was discussed, which we are really lucky that the YMCA and Forterra went together to buy Camp Kilworth, but I wanted to talk about um, their volunteer opportunities for Camp Kilworth. On Earth Day, they're, are, they're having a work party also from 9 a.m. To, to noon on Saturday. And then April, uh, they're having a work party on May 4th on Saturday. They're also, uh, you can go on April 18th, and uh, which is this week at 4 p.m. and take a hike. And if you've never been to Camp, Camp Kilworth, it is one of the most beautiful spots in Federal Way, and you, you need to see it. Uh, they have replaced the main gate, and it doesn't look like the old camp gate. I cr cried a little bit when I saw that, but um, it needed to be replaced for, for security. So I would encourage you to get um, involved in Camp Kilworth. It's going to, it's, it's just amazing that it's still <coughs> in our community. Um, on Saturday, there is a celebration here in uh, Federal Way, uh, the Festival of Via Sky P and the Sikh community. Um, this was the third year that they've done this here in our community. They expected seven to 9,000 people. It's over on the Warehouser or the um, IRG campus. And I believe there was probably 7,000 people there. Uh, there are people from around the state that that came and we had my husband and I had a 17 year old junior from one of the Kent high schools and she was our guide for the day and um, I'd like to thank her for helping us understand what was going on and introducing us to a lot of people uh, AARP will be having a shredding event this Saturday. This Saturday is a very busy Saturday at the BECU Federal Way Pavilions Financial Center on Pack Highway from 9 to 1. And I'll give this information to Amy so she can put it online for us. And um, tomorrow is a regional transit committee and we will be discussing uh, transit safety and security and the Metro Van Pool, Metro Flex, and Community Van Programs. And that's tomorrow from 2 to 4.30. Oh, and May is a lot of, there's a lot of different things that happen in May, but it is National Cities, Towns, and Villages Month. Oh. Very good. Okay, yeah. thank you. Take the whole month off. Council right? President Kutchmark. <laughs> thank you, Mayor. We, we do have a lot of events coming up. And so if you're interested in getting involved in Federal Way, just go to our website. Uh, go to the events page, you'll, you'll find all sorts of things going on, uh, especially at the community center. Um, if you haven't been to Camp Kilworth, picking up on what uh, Councilmember Honda was talking about, just head down Dash Point Road um, to um, pass the Lakota treatment plant. <coughs> you'll find Camp Kilworth on your right. Uh, beautiful piece of property. Just keep going, you'll finally see a sign. Beautiful piece of property with. Um, you'll be able to go through the trails. But when you get to the <coughs> middle where they used to have the campfires, a fabulous view of Puget Sound. Some of the things that haven't been discussed right now is that the, thank you, uh, our economic development person, Tanya Carter. <coughs> We're having focus groups. And this morning, we had one on uh, business. And so thank you um, around TC3, our, our new development. <coughs> Sorry. And then um, finally, there's a CHOP Charity Challenge, April 26th at Federal High School, where they fill the bags for um, kids who come to school without any food. So it's called the Bag Ladies, fill the lunch bags. <coughs> Sorry, so the children, this irritating my throat. The Big Program. All right, uh, thank you very much, Council President. All right, uh, item seven, the consent agenda. These items have gone uh, through committee and can be passed all at once. I'll read through the items and ask you if, uh, uh, if you'd want um, 
uh, to pull an item for separate consideration. Item A, minutes for the April 2, 2024 regular and special, special and regular meetings. B, street light infill approval to award. C, fiber optic loop, loop uh, South 317th Street to 272nd Street, approval to bid. D, former target building demolition, project acceptance. E, authorization apply for transportation grants. F, accept transportation grant and authorize the execution of the um, associated agreements, State Route 99 at Federal Way High School, pedestrian improvements, design and construction. G, Washington State Department of Commerce Planning, grant and interagency agreement. H, joint use operations and maintenance facility, 85% uh, design report and authorization to bid. I, joint use operations and maintenance facility, frontage improvements, 85% design report, transfer capital improvement funds and authorization to bid. J, resolution authorizing the allocation of funds in accordance with the 2023 South King Housing Homelessness Par Partners, uh, skip, uh, it's SKHHP Housing Capital Fund. K, Internet Crimes Against Children, ICAC, Memorandum of Understanding between Seattle Police Department, SPD, and Federal APD. Um, L, Parks Signage Contract Amendment. M, um, Electrical Line and Fiber Optic Easement on Lakota Park Property. N, Department of Commerce Grant Acceptance, Celebration Park Field, tur uh, field 8 Turf. O, Resolution, Celebration Park Field 8 Artificial Funding and PMOU with the Historical Society of Federal Way, Amendment 2. Council, are there any items you would want pulled for separate consideration? All right, uh, pre Council President Coach Moore, do you have a motion? I move approval of items A through P. Second. second. It's been a motion and a second to, uh, uh, to approve items A through P on the consent agenda. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, matters passed unanimously. Council business, item eight. Uh, item A is uh, Port of Seattle Economic Development Grant. We'll have a presentation from Tanya Carter, Economic Development Director, um, and then we'll go from there. So, Tanya, the floor is yours. A little bit of help from our IT department. Um, so I will start while this is warming up. Good evening, Mayor, uh, Council President, and Council Members. Tanya Carter, your Economic Development Director. Um, we have some fun stuff to talk about tonight. Um, grant funding for the city. So um, I will actually be presenting two um, grant application requests uh, tonight. The first one is the Economic Development and Port of Seattle grant. Um, there were some questions about this the other day by email, and just to clarify, this is the said grant that was uh, questioned in the email. So um, it is a grant that, um, well, actually, so let me get to the policy question first. Uh, the policy question before you is, should the council um, authorize staff to apply for the 2024 Port of Seattle Partnership uh, Program grant? And so uh, tonight, what we wanted to present to you is two things. Um, number one, uh, give you a bit of background on the grant program, as well as share the results from last year when we also were awarded and uh, participated in the grant program, and then make the request uh, for consideration to apply this year as well. Um, so essentially, uh, some background information on here, I won't read it all, but what the city uh, employs the grant to do is to uh, execute a uh, outreach program to for business retention and expansion, which is the backbone of economic development. So um, essentially, last year, what we did is we uh, reached out to 500 businesses over a two-month period, and there were uh, two things that we were trying to accomplish. The first was to update business uh, contact information, which we have shared about before, is very difficult to uh, maintain up-to-date records from uh, the business license information that we receive from the Department of Revenue at the state level. So we really endeavor uh, to keep that information up to date by outreaching uh, every year to uh, a portion of our businesses. Of the 500 businesses that we outreach to, uh, we also ask them uh, to fill out a three-question survey or to answer a three-question survey. We keep it very brief, very concise, and we ask the same questions every year because that allows us to get a baseline of uh, information and track the trends over time. Um, also, uh, people don't really like really long surveys, so we just try to keep it to two quantitative questions and one qualitative question. So the return rate is uh, one of the highest. We've really, really honed the methodology over the last couple of years, so we are able to attain over a 50% uh, return rate on our surveys. So, um, 
this, I'll just go quickly um, over the results of the survey, but essentially the key thing here is uh, in which of the following areas does the, does the city of Federway currently help your business? And on the right-hand side, the top areas identified were road or sidewalk access, safety and lighting, as well as permitting. On question number two, um, similar question, but it's uh, framed a little bit differently. Which of the following areas can the city of Federway improve to help your business more? And here the top identified areas were safety and lighting, marketing and promotion, and commercial affordability. The last question, what keeps you up at night as a business owner? Um, the top three, uh, not too surprising, but safety and crime, homelessness, and then economy. So um, what does this mean? Uh, something that economic development really takes pride in is not just asking questions and taking surveys, but we ask questions and take surveys to actually uh, deliver on what the concerns are, what the requests are, and what the needs are of the businesses in our city. So here, what we're really trying to do is retain our businesses, um, attract new businesses, and create programs to support those businesses. So here, you can see the direct um, programs that we have developed uh, based on what the top three asks are from the businesses. So again, uh, we really make sure that we get back to the businesses and show and share um, that we are making um, changes to the requests that they have. I won't go through the details on here because it's all things that we've talked about. Um, business safety programs, the uh, mobile surveillance trailers that we purchased uh, for the police department and we are implementing a program. Oh, sorry. They're here now. Great. So um, we are collaborating with the police department to make that uh, program available at no charge to the businesses that need them. Um, more information to come on that. Uh, and then also we're collaborating with the Washington Retail Association uh, to really uh, push out into the community all of the resources that are available both at the state and the national level. And we did have a presentation on that um, at FEDRAC. So um, that is just kind of a summary of that uh, program. Marketing, uh, as uh, Council President alluded to today, we are starting a major um, push for marketing of Federway to get Federway on the map and to change the perceptions of Federway to really highlight all of the great things that we have in our community. And then the last is commercial affordability. Um, several programs that also council granted funding for um, from ARPA to create uh, commercial affordability in the city. Um, and there's two programs that we are working on right now for that. Um, for this year, similar, the outreach, as I mentioned, and then also on tourism and marketing material, um, helping to further build our media library of photos of all of the wonderful assets that we have in our city so that we can create all of the marketing collateral um, that we start to push out. And these are just some examples of what collateral can look like. And the option tonight for uh, council is either approve the proposed application for the port <coughs> grant or do not approve and ask, uh, give staff direction. Councilor Robert Daniel. Yeah, uh, just two quick questions. Uh, what is the ground amount, uh, grant amount looking like? Like how much? Oh, thank you. I apologize for not uh, clarifying that. So um, it is essentially based on population. So it's a, a dollar per person, if you will. And uh, it's up to $60,000. And so Federway has more than 60,000 people. So we get the max, which is $60,000. That $60,000 receipt is predicated on a matching uh, funding from the city and so that would essentially be to get the whole $60,000 $30,000 for a total of $90,000 in the program potential so up to $90,000 if we utilize all the funds and all the matching and then there's a gets a little bit complicated but essentially a portion of that matching can be in kind which is staff time and resources gotcha. and then if it's not in kind does it come out of the uh, what department would it, would it come out of the what, what Economic development, it? yeah. Okay, we're good. Come on. Uh -huh. Yeah, so and already it would be already um, from our allocated budget, so no impact otherwise. Gotcha. And uh, the other one is is the outreach program. What we're looking at funding with this grant. I'm sorry, the what? The outreach program you just talked about. Yes. Is that what we're looking at for funding for this? Yes. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's for Honda. Uh, the the trailers with the blue flashing lights. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen that in the police parking lot. I believe the three new ones are there. I would eventually like to get a report on how that has impacted uh, prevention of crime or catching criminals. Okay, I will coordinate with PD on that when we get the program up and running. Um, even, well, we've, we've got those out in the community already, so we should probably have some data already if we could get some information on that. And also, if lighting is, a, is safety and lighting, uh, 
Lighting, I imagine, is street lights that the folks are talking about? Yes. So, well, I mean, various. It depends. So it was just a, a bucket term because there were um, very, uh, a very large quantity of surveys. So it was trying to bucket, um, you know, exactly their responses into a bucket. Uh, I, I realize that we just voted tonight for uh, a, a streetlight program and that uh, we had hoped to put more streetlights out. I hope that as we work on, or as staff and the mayor work on the budget that will be presented to council in September, that there is something in there to every year increase more streetlights and aggressively do that because I do believe that they help with safety and I do believe that the people and the people who live here and the people who work here, this is something that they've talked about for years as a, a need and um, as much as we can afford to address that need, I would like to see us do that. Well, actually, EJ, well, thank you. I, I, didn't we, uh, are, we're way down the list in regard to uh, going, aren't we, with the ARPA money that we utilized and, and didn't we add to that? Can you talk about our we, lighting program? We did, and I think that's what the deputy mayor, or, yeah. sorry, council member uh, Honda just referenced. Um, we got a lot of that list done. There's a lot still to do though, so I, it, you know, if that's where the priority is, we can certainly put more street lights. And those are, those are the ones that are driven by requests. So I mean, we can certainly keep adding to them and working with the police department, high crime areas, if that's a council priority. Gotcha. Well, yeah, it's it's a priority for all of us. All right, thank you. Yeah. And then, uh, Chief, how many uh, how many of those uh, mobile surveillance trailers are out in the uh, in the police yard right now, in the back? Yesterday, I saw three. I don't know how many. You know, there's six in the backyard right now. Yeah, they need some IT work still before they can be deployed. So yeah, oh yeah, I, okay. Yeah, very good. And when that is when that is done, we are collaborating with the PD to get a little bit more of a formal program that we can access. But we have to wait for PD to um, complete the IT stuff. Very good. Okay, okay. Um, uh, Councilmember, oh, Dovey Councilmember uh, Dovey. Yeah, I, I just want to make a, a comment. Uh, I agree with Councilmember Honda. Street lights are important, and we need to do it, but. When we went through the street lights with the ARPA money just recently, we were focused on residential, it seemed like. Yep. So it would need to be, and businesses are probably talking about lighting in their parking lots and around their business. So right. when we have those discussions, I'm just planting the seed that all street lights are not the same. So we need probably need to look at it at two different ways, lighting in our neighborhoods, which is very, very important and then lighting in businesses, which most landlords provide, but we want might need to supplement some areas. So I just wanted to clarify I, that's a that great there's point. two different discussions, I believe. In fact, one of those lists had 176 or something like 178. Um, Correct, that's the residential list. Correct, yeah. And that's the one that we were initially yeah. referring to. We did residential and, and you know, I would wanna thank Councilmember Honda for pushing that. She's been really behind street lights and coming through land use and ARPA money, but I think we think about neighborhoods and we're not thinking about the business locations that they may like, need lighting if that's what they're asking for. Very good, okay, all right. So let's uh, keep an inventory of you know top top ones that we can make sure uh, end up on a list and uh, it's, it, it's certainly very important. Councilman McDaniel. Yeah, um, real quick, uh, when we do actually have these blue light camera systems ready to go, what is gonna be the portal or process for a business owner to request those for the property? Um, so in coordination with PD, we have not finalized the process, but some of the conversations have been currently the way that it works is with um, email or phone call to PD, but with the um, advent of us having an inventory of eight, um, we also have discussed having some kind of a, um, you know, maybe more uh, formalized system, but essentially it's up to the PD. and. Uh, Chief, please jump in if I'm uh, out of line, but uh, it will be oh, up to the right. PD to allocate um, how they are distributed based on request. So sure. sure. And one thing we want to be cautious of is not creating an expectation that it will be first come, first serve. Uh, you know, I put my request in last week, and so I'm ahead of you, because what we will do is, while that's a factor, we're going to put them where the area is the hottest. And so somebody's going to get bumped out of alignment, and you know we don't want to create too many hard feelings, but that's where they will go is hot spots. Gotcha. And currently, it's an email to the. Uh, yep. You send an email to us. We'll get it to the right person, or a phone call to us. Yep. Any of those will work. Awesome. Thank you. Try it. 
Councilor Honda. Uh, so the, I guess this would be for you, um, Chief. So the blue lights, on the, the cameras on there, could they be near intersections that have uh, a history of a lot of accidents or? It, Sure, we could put them there, but on most of our high impact, high trafficking intersections, we have safe city cameras already. And we do look at that video for crashes. What about a neighborhood that's having a lot of vandalism or? Uh, Certainly, yep. So it doesn't have to be in a business, it could be in a residential area too, yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Councilor Walsh. Yeah, uh, just a couple of questions. One, with, with the, the, the blue light trailers, uh, is the plan for them to be at different locations for a number of weeks or for uh, a, a very long-term period? What, what's, the, what's the plan there, or is there a plan? Yes and no. It'll go from <laughs> hot spot to hot spot to hot spot, yep, depending on how long a spot is hot and okay. what spot gets hotter. Okay. I sense so they'll, a they'll cement be, uh, metaphor coming up. It's yeah. not going to be set in stone, right? And All so right. expectations in that regard should be minimized. Okay. Otherwise, we're going to have some disappointed people. All right. So that sounds great. That that makes great sense to have them okay. floating more or less. Yeah. Yep. So, and and then my my other question, with the the lighting with businesses, are there, from my observation, most of the business areas are pretty well lit. I mean, are there some are, are there some, I don't, I don't know who this is, question is for, but are there Tanya. some uh, commercial areas that, uh, that are less well lit that there's a big concern with? So the, the general sentiment from the survey was, um, and, and kind of the takeaway, wasn't that there were, uh, there was a lack of large swathes, swaths of, uh, you know, ground or area that wasn't lit it was uh, just more focused on hey there's like a little pocket over here or, hey there's a you know kind of a dead spot over here so it was more just little pockets and and that's of course where there tends to be things that happen and congregate um so i mean i think it in my personal opinion i think it's very difficult to address all of that um you know and uh, certainly it's things that as uh, council member dovey was mentioning it is uh, in large part up to the uh, property owners and property managers uh, because it is private property and I, I, and the question I guess this will probably be more for for uh, Keith, uh, with the when developments go in, uh, commercial developments go in. Are there? I, I suspect that there's lighting requirements with that or, or not. Um, uh, great question. Um, generally, uh, most developers will provide site lighting. Um, is there a requirement in the code for minimum lighting? I'd have to get back to you on that one, council okay. member. I'm still a little jet lagged from my trip today. So let me get back to you on that one. I, All right. I can't recall any minimum, uh, but just generally speaking, most retail and multifamily provide site lighting. Okay. All right, thank you. All right. Uh, uh, Council President Coachmark. I move to authorize staff to apply for the 2024 Port of Seattle Economic Development Grant. Second. It's been a motion. A second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Matter passed unanimously. Thank you very much. All right. Now we're item B Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Grant, EECBG Grant. Presentation from Tanya Clark. Tanya Carter. Hi, thank you, Tanya Carter, your Economic Development Director. I'm here to present another uh, request for a grant application. Um, so we actually have our um, grant consultants on the on Zoom. I just wanted to confirm that with um, City Clerk. Uh, and in the meantime, the uh, yeah, we have two two people connected. I don't okay. Who are Should they? Ariana? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so the policy question before council tonight is, uh, should the city council authorize staff to apply for the 2024 Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Grant Program? Um, to uh, recap, this is the same grant that was presented at the FEDERAC uh, committee meeting that I believe uh, all of council was in attendance as well. Um, so this is the same slides um, and it is now an official request um, to apply for this grant. Um, so uh, essentially uh, the uh, council uh, approved 
a, the funding for uh, using ARPA funds for hiring a grant finder and a grant writer for the city. So this is a part of the pilot program that the city is conducting this year for um, finding grants in a more formal, uh, formalized program. And uh, this particular grant uh, is something that uh, was researched and uh, was found that it was something that we um, could not only apply for, but it's uh, similar on along the lines of the grant that we just reviewed before, that it is uh, more or less a, a guaranteed grant. Um, so that's also something that is really nice. Uh, I have Ariana, who is from CPEN, our uh, grant consultancy that will present the highlights of what the EECBG grant is uh, about and then what we would like to use it for. Uh, so if Ariana is on the call, it would be great if you could go over it just briefly as we did at the FEDERAC meeting uh, previously. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Okay, excellent, great, thank you so much. Well. Thank you, Tanya, for that introduction. So I'll be happy to go over this grant. So this is the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Grant Program. This is an um, award allocation. It's a formula grant, so it's not a competitive grant program. There is an allocation of $147,860 for federal way. So the nice thing about this is that because it's not a competitive grant program, this money is allocated for federal way, and as long as the activities that we are proposing are within the scope of what is allowable uses for funding, the award will, will come to federal way. Um, so this grant program is aiming to build a clean and equitable energy economy, uh, particularly that prioritizes disadvantaged communities and prioritizes equity and inclusion. And so there are multiple ways that a government entity could use this grant, but the way that Tanya and um, economic development have discussed and want to use this grant is for workforce development. And so workforce development is one of the allowable categories within the grant program. And so with that, the city of federal way would be receiving technical assistance which would allow you to participate in program design curriculum development stakeholder engagement and also workforce needs assessment and the other benefit of this funding is that it will set federal way up for other funding in the in the future and so with this with this being a planning grant this opens doors for other grants for things such as construction funding and actually implementing the program once there's a strategic plan and a planning in place. Um, let's see, I think, I think we could go to the next slide, Tanya. Um, so, so here I'll tell you um, a bit about what the project would would be used for. So this is what is informally being called right now the Clean Tech Innovation Corridor. And so the Pacific Raceways track owners are doing advanced manufacturing uh, at their facility as well as research and development for sustainable mobility and sustainable fuel and energy projects, which is how it ties in with the um, energy efficiency part of the grant is the um, you know sustainable fuel and energy projects that are happening with Pacific Raceways. And while it's wonderful that they have this the space, you know, the track where they can actually test some of their sustainable mobility projects, they don't have sufficient office and lab space um, for, uh, for what they need to do. And so the EECBG funding would be used to support planning part of the IRG building um, and turning that into office and lab space for Pacific Raceways, advanced manufacturing businesses and projects. And so that's one part of it. The other part of it is that seeing as how this is a workforce development focused, the funding would also be used to create this workforce pipeline with Highland College and potentially other colleges in the area. And so th those, those colleges could locate on the Pacific Raceways um, Sustainable Mo Mobility Campus in the IRG 
property and be function really as an active learning campus. So students could be being directly trained for the jobs that are needed for this advanced manufacturing tech. And they could be doing the learning right there on, on the campus, you know, rather than just having everything be theory-based in a classroom at some, some other location. And so this is why this grant um, works really well for this project and doing this workforce development and the, the curriculum development and, and planning the project. And so overall, this would create clean energy jobs, a job pipeline, and then job training. Uh, you know, especially for individuals from disadvantaged communities and populations, which is a big focus of, of the grant program. So I'll hand it back over to, to Tanya to follow up. So essentially the policy question tonight is, uh, should uh, council approve this uh, grant application? Or if not, please provide um, direction to staff. All right, Councilmember Honda. Thank you. Uh, so the the goal or the the hope is that the um, Pacific Raceways would use the headquarter building. Correct. So we have uh, been negotiating with them for about six months. Um, so this is fairly far along in discussions. Um, so they are very well aware of it. The mayor has been briefed on it. Um, there are many parties that are involved in it, um, including Pape um, Pacific Raceways. Uh, so uh, it's fairly far along in the conversation. And how much space will they be using? As much space as uh, they're able to lease out. It's obviously not something that we can predict. Um, it's just based on the contracts that are negotiated between two private parties. So my, my question is, if they need lab space, the tech center, which is just down the road, has labs. Uh, the headquarter building was for lawyers and accountants, as my husband always says. So they it's could absolutely go, open. Yeah, it's open they could, for, they could go yep. into the tech center mm -hmm. um, and, and have lab space already there. Yep. But that's not being discussed. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it is being discussed and it is oh, okay. a, a possibility, but it's just, I mean, that's the whole kind okay. of IRG campus. And so the main focus is the um, the headquarter building, and then of course, if there's, we don't know if it's wet lab space, dry lab space, um, you know, what kind of lab space they need. So it'll just be dependent on whatever the company is that decides that they need space. Can okay. I talk about our meeting yesterday uh, in my office, you know, with, with Jason? Sure. Um, so uh, essentially, the, the meeting that we had yesterday was with the track owner of Pacific Raceways, and um, they uh, have what the, the, uh, advanced manufacturing and the space that they are building and finalizing at the track is uh, going to be called the Pacific Innovation Center. And so uh, there's two challenges that the track has. Number one is as they have uh, bigger and bigger races there, um, they uh, need parking space. And so they don't have enough parking <coughs> space if they really build out the R&D and the offices and the lab space there. And so that's kind of the first thing is, um, you know, using the IRG parking, which is almost 2,000 spaces uh, for those bigger races. And then the second part of it is that they don't need to build the office and lab space, so they have parking. And then those uh, you know, organizations can use the space in the campus. And so uh, the negotiations are, are, you know, progressing along. Uh, nothing is ever completed until everything is inked. But um, you know, the track owner thought that it was now necessary to, you know, brief the city on how progressed we are uh, in those conversations. And uh, the entities that have been working on this, um, PAPE, Pacific Raceways, Federal Way, and IRG, um, we all talk regularly and we are having a meeting in um, two weeks to present the site to the Clean Tech Alliance uh, as well. So they are going to come and check out the site um, because they also have an alliance of, it's a trade alliance, so they have many members as well. So for the, uh, the education piece, do these students already exist and where are they being educated at now? So um, it's a little bit bigger of a conversation. Um, there are uh, major universities that are also in collaboration with the Pacific Innovation Center, which is the advanced manufacturing part of it. And so uh, there is one particular organization that uh, is very interested in STEM. And so it would be essentially, the, the, this is a very high level rough concept 
but we would be creating that program and essentially it would be a program that would be available for those universities and for anyone else that would you know want to come in and partake in those programs so i mean this is not something that uh is far enough along yet that we have the whole curricula which is what um this grant actually would be from the department of energy so they would uh essentially allocate a cons or they will allocate a consultant to federal way from the department of energy that they have elected that would help to put all of this together in collaboration with those universities and um, the organizations. And my, my last question is, our King County Council Member, uh, Council Member Von Reichbauer is a big supporter of the raceways. Is he, is King County involved in this in any way? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yes. Funding? Yeah. Yes. Yep. Very much so. I mean, there, there, there's, there's, there was a big proposal a year ago that he's been working with the county and the county, county executive, the county council, there was a big uh, um, ordinance that, that was talking about expansion. This is a huge deal for economic development in the region, and the King County Executive and the Council have been okay. very engaged. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, Councilmember Doby. Um, I think I just heard that if we apply for the grant, the, fe the city gets the money, correct? Yes. Who does the work? <laughs> so, you're, I mean, I know you're qualified. But you're talking about taking a landholder, a business opportunity. I don't think you have time to do it all yourself. I mean, well, we're gonna. We're, that, that's funny. You bring that up, council. I mean, you're gonna, gonna. I mean, gonna it, be, it, the uh, money. I think that it's what I'm hearing. It's seed money yeah. to go through a business proposal to see if all the parties can work, and then you're gonna need millions of dollars, really, to do it. This is a. This is a. If this works, this is a multi-million dollar investment on everybody's part. It's not just, hey, we're going to do this. So, I mean, I, ex I respect your capabilities, but I don't believe one person is able to do the business plan and do all this and get it to the point that it can be executed. It's a public-private so, partnership, and it's you know two private entities, and so the the public entity is not the one that is. I mean, to put it really simply, not doing the heavy lifting. So we were the ones that brought the two entities together. We were the ones that basically had the idea and the concept. And so I now it's a- I think it's a great a idea. Uh, but I guess I'm just concerned. We get the 159000 or whatever it is. How's it going to get spent and how are we going to get to step two? Consultants. So uh, the Department of Energy, we would receive the funding. And Ariana, jump in if I'm not correct on the logistics. But we would receive the funding but it would be allocated to pay for the consultant who would do all this work. Okay, so, so you just said the magic word, we're gonna hire a consultant. Yeah, but it was, so I apologize, that was maybe unclear. So economic development would be managing it, but there would be a consultant that would do physically all of this, you know, the needs assessment, the, um, you know, all the studies, all the discovery, all of putting the report together. Um, so I apologize for not being. And, and then what's the next request gonna be? How many million? I, no not idea. there yet. <laughs> no this is a pilot program. So if, no if council actually uh, really, uh, let's say, is happy with the pilot program for finding grants, I mean, oh, no, we've I, been doing this for four months and we've found some pretty good grants. So yeah. well, sometimes uh, you got to be thankful you find them, but you got to reject them because it's too much work. And that's why I'm trying to find out. Oh. It, you know, free money is not always free money. I appreciate you reframing that, and I apologize for not understanding it. Um, so one of the uh, steps in the process that we have identified, and I believe it was one of you, I don't remember who it was, um, had suggested that we really uh, vet the grants up front for what their back-end requirements are. So there is a note in your um, packet on what the back-end requirements are for this. So the actual administration, not the actual work, but just the administration of the grant is essentially just attending a call um, periodically at writing kind of a midterm, hey, this is how we're using the money, and then a final report on, hey, this is what we did with it. Um, so it is manageable, and that is something that we have incorporated, thanks to, I think, whoever's suggestion it was um, on looking at that. So that is a criteria now that we will assess. Okay. Thank you. But I, uh, Council Member, I think you've, you've brought up a really good point. We've got, uh, as our economic development director, she's got an individual named Julie who works with her. Uh, this is a budget year. We're, you know, that's what I was referring to is I, I think that we've got a lot of irons in the fire, so to speak, on economic development. And uh, we'll be uh, just a heads up that I think we need to expand our economic development department. And I think you touched on the key point. 
Uh, Council Member Gale? Yeah. Um, I'm glad we got to meet the other day, just random coincidence, because it answered a lot of the questions that uh, Council Member Dovey had. So just to clarify it, so I'm going to try to, it's a planning grant, it's 147000 Department of Energy is going to provide a consultant. The money goes pretty much straight across to the consultant. He builds out a game plan. We take the game plan and then present it again to who? Uh, so if by who you mean uh, to council, of course, but then uh, to this partnership, to the CTIC group, um, essentially the group, mainly Pacific Wasteways, you know, will have the pipeline of businesses that are coming in. And so those businesses, uh, one of them has indicated that they want to have a STEM program and a CTE program um, built into this whole uh, project. And so that was kind of the impetus to kind of match the grant with the desire of, uh, you know, some of the partners that are in this collaboration for having STEM. And so this essentially not only will help design and develop the curricula, but it will also, as, um, as we mentioned, open the door to uh, construction funding and other things that can help, uh, you know, to further the project. Gotcha. So once we get that plan, then there might be potential other grants, or at least then we have a, a game plan to reach out to the other, the other exactly. members. Okay. Yeah. Um, one of the things, every time I hear a grant come up, and these guys have heard it many times, I always ask them if it, is it going through this uh, our, our consultant stuff. So I know this one is, so I can check that one off. Uh, the other one is I'm like I'm checking on for what exactly is coming in for money. So while I do like the idea where we're going with this one, um, I won't count the money towards the city for my, my mindset, but um, I'm curious to see what the, the plan is going to look like that they present for us on that one. So. Me too. I think Thank it's you. going to be a, a really interesting program, and I think it will be very landmark. If, if this all kind of goes in that direction, I think it will be very landmark for the region. That's a big space to be filling up, so yeah. yeah. Right. Council Member Separd Dawson. Thank you, Mary, and thank you, Tanya. So for this grant, when we're talking about disadvantaged communities, we're not talking about neighborhoods, correct? Particularly, or? Correct. I'm, I'm not totally sure I understand the question, but... Um, it, it, that we haven't identified them yet because we haven't applied for and received the grant yet. So it's maybe a detail that I probably can't exactly explicitly answer. But I would, be happy I, to, I would be happy to communicate with you as we go along the journey so I can, or with all of council, of course, um, you know, as we get more into the details. Okay. Because um, that's where I was headed. It's like, okay, how do we define what that means? But also when they're talking about creating clean energy jobs, um, no, it's not the slide. When we're talking, yeah, about jobs, how many jobs are we looking at at the end of the day? That's what the, so yeah. this is just permission to apply. We haven't applied for the grant yet, so we haven't even gotten into the actual, so it, all excellent questions, but I'm, I'm unable to answer because we haven't actually applied for the grant, which means we haven't started the work and we haven't hired the consultants yet that will help us to figure that out. So it's kind of, Maybe what I'm trying to say is a little bit of a journey, so this isn't saying that we'll know all the answers up front, which is why we're hiring the consultants to do the work so we can provide the answers. Does that? Are they helping sort of us apply for the grant? I'm sorry? Are they helping us apply for the grant? Who is they? The consultants. Oh, no, so that's why we have it. Well, so our grant, our grant writers, that's why we have them, as they um, have been absolutely instrumental, and we couldn't have done this without them. Um, Ariane, I don't know if you're still on the line, but if you can kind of share a uh, high level, how many hours do you think that we've invested um, in trying to identify if this grant is feasible for us and what all the requirements are and, you know, how to uh, answer the questions on the application? 20 hours? Yeah, yeah, I would say 20 to possibly getting close to even 30 hours. I've had multiple conversations with the grant program managers at EECBG to make sure that the project was eligible and fit in the correct buckets of activities of funding that they have. So yeah, there's there has been a lot of work onto it already. So I would say that's a good estimate, somewhere between 20 to, to 30 hours. So it's, it's um, what I, I think what we were trying to maybe share with council is that um, applying for grants is a lot of work, um, but as to, to council member Dovey's point, um, but we are trying to be very focused and collaborate with um, finance department so that we can really be focused on what are the projects and the priorities that the city has identified. So we're not just going for a grant that we see because we see that there's free money, but we're really trying to be mindful about this is a project we want to do. Let's find some money for it. 
and then let's vet, uh, you know, on the back end if we can operationally ex execute it and, and go for it. Thank you. All right, Councilman Rana. Thank you. Will IRG be a partner or will they just be a landlord? Uh, uh, a partner. So I mean, it's not, there's nothing that's defined yet. This is very, you know, it's, uh, again, these are two private parties, and so we are not privy to their, you know, all of their discussions, but they um, have expressed interest in this, and they have been involved in all the conversations that we've been having. So everything that we are sharing here, um, we have discussed with them, and they've been involved in. Good, thank you. All right. Council President. I, I just want to clarify, the money is coming from the Washington State Department of Commerce. Is that where the funding is coming from? Department of Energy. Department of Energy. Mm -hmm. And it's it's uh, federal, federal. So it's yeah. not it's, oh, it's not federal. Yeah. Thank federal. you, yeah. Yeah. thank you. Yeah, it's at the federal level. So the, the state isn't involved at all. No. Hmm. Not this level. Okay. Um, I, I have one more question. Yeah. So Tanya, I think this is a a great thing to piece together. It's a lot of people that could benefit and a lot of opportunity, but. The one question when you talk about transferring 50 to 100 percent of Fedway's empty space, the old warehouser building, it may be very aggressive. It would be great if we even got 10 percent. But the real question to this deal that falls apart would see, and Councilmember Honda asked about IRG if they're um, partners or they're landlords or I mean, do we have some sort of, we all know this could blow up, we're going to spend the money from the federal government and you say, hey, we don't pursue it. I mean, that's the worst case. But is the, the landlord or the owner of the building, I mean, are they really engaged and they say, hey, this is something we want to try or are we trying to force something into that building and, no. Nope. I mean, because that's kind this of is the, um, I mean, I'd, I don't want to put words into um, the property owner's mouth, mouth but, but it is the first time that I've been working with him that he was legitimately um, excited. He went to Pacific Raceways, um, you know, saw the site. Um, we've had conversations there. Um, so, you know, again, to your point, you're a businessman, you know, um, you know, it's not over till everything's inked. But um, there have been significant conversations and it's been, you know, discussed to the point where, um, you know, we, the track owner was briefing the mayor yesterday that this is something that, you know, in the next um, 60 to 90 days that should start to materialize something. So, you know, again, there's a lot that has to happen in between, but everyone has been involved in all of the conversations and it's not, um, it, it's concrete enough that we're moving forward with, you know, putting in the work for the workforce development side of it. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Councilor Walsh. Yeah, so I, I'm just kind of looking at it. At worst case scenario, we get the grant, we do all the work, and it doesn't go together. Uh, is there any, what, what, what's the downside? There isn't a downside. I mean, there's always um, something, especially with something like this, this kind of a program, um, it's something that is needed for the region. So it's transferable, not just, you know, here, but in collaboration with, you know, the colleges, with the universities. Uh, you know, this is something that, can be transferred to, you know, not necessarily this particular physical building, but to, you know, even another site in federal way. So it, I see a lot of possibilities, even if this particular location and project um, doesn't go through. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Council President Koshmar, do you have a motion? I do, Mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, I move uh, to authorize staff to apply for the 2024 Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Grant. Second. It's been a motion. A second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Uh, the matter passes unanimously. Great job, Tanya. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank Council. Thank you very much. Great job. And Tanya, thank you for spending your birthday with us. Uh, you've had a busy day with all the consultations and these two okay. business items. Um, Happy why don't you birthday. take the rest of the night off? <laughs> thank you. Just kidding. Happy birthday. Thanks. All right. I've been waiting all day to use that line. All right. Item uh, nine, a second uh, reading and enactment. Item A. Council Bill 876, authorizing the execution of Town Center 3, TC3, development agreement. Would the city clerk please read the ordinance title? Council Bill 876, authorizing the execution of the Town Center 3, TC3, development agreement. An ordinance of the City of Federal Washington relating to entering into a development agreement with Trent Development Incorporated for the TC3 properties pursuant to the provisions of Chapter 19.85, 
Federal Revised Code. All right, uh, Councilor Murdovi, do you have a motion? Yes, um, I move to the approval of the proposed ordinance. Second. It's been a motion. A second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Oh, uh, actually, uh, Councilor Murdovi. Yeah. Um, I'm going to vote for this. I mean, we've spent many, many years on this project, but I just want to acknowledge and thank uh, Ron Walker for his input, his efforts, and the things he um, has brought forward. Because I do believe some of the points, and many of the points he's brought, if I'd thought about them a year and a half ago, or I'd probably be on the same page. Um, um, but I, I do appreciate what all the effort Ron has done, and. You know, again, I've always said I, I think we should be looking at other locations and other properties downtown for other projects. And um, so I just want to make sure that I acknowledge Mr. Walker for all his efforts. Well, I think it's unanimous on this council that we all appreciate his input. Thank you, Ron, uh, very much. Actually, I'm going to tell that story about your about your tree uh, for a long time. It's a great it's a great story. Thank you. All right. Is there any uh, further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, matter passed unanimously. Thank you very much. All right, um, item B. Item B, Council Bill 877, Tax Increment Financing. Would the city clerk please read the ordinance title? Council Bill 877, Tax Increment Financing, an ordinance of the city of Federal Washington designating the downtown tax increment area, setting a sunset date for the increment area, identifying the public improvements to be financed, imposing a deadline for the commencement of construction, indicating the city's intent to issue bonds to finance public projects, providing that the increment area will take effect June 1st, 2024, and providing for related matters. All right, Councilor Randovi. I move approval of the proposed ordinance. Second. 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 It's been a motion. A second. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Better pass unanimously. Thank you very much. All right, now on to council reports, second meeting of the month. We are on to Council Member Doby. Um, I don't have any special report, but I do want to bring uh, up something I think that should be on our radar if we're talking about. Many of you may have read um, Council Reagan Dunn's statements to the paper about squatters and rental houses and the epidemic that's going through King County where the courts are backed up and people that own property that rent to somebody can't get them out for many up to a year sometimes two years I you know I think many of us know somebody that's had that situation or heard about it and I don't know if there's anything on the local level that we can start to do just for federal way and maybe that's a, a state or a King County issue but I would like to at least have us think about federal way can we control the issues of people that are taking property owners property that they rent to them and they don't move out and if there's things we can do ourselves and maybe they're not but I'd like to put it on the the front burner so we are protecting landlords and people that are making investment in property or even people that have somebody come into their house uh, and they can't get them out and so I just bring that forward it's something I think that I'd like to see us uh, address or find out what possible things we might be able to do to proactively combat that issue all right thank you thank you uh, Ryan uh, <coughs> let's uh, uh, leave council uh, or let's you and I talk about that with Brian tomorrow uh, thank you very much all right uh, Councilor Walsh uh, no major report as well uh, I've been out of town for for nearly the last uh, last two weeks uh, during that time I got to see a lot of other communities uh, some of them beautiful communities, some of them communities with challenges much greater than ours. And But it is good to be home. It is good to see how other communities handle different situations. But it's great to be back here where we can actually work together. And it, it makes me appreciate all the more uh, the opportunities we have here in Federal Way, the the potential that we have here in Federal Way, and to work <clears throat> with, with all of you to, to help realize that potential so thank you all right thank you Councilor Honda thank you uh, this week fusion is celebrating 10 years of having their boutique and last Saturday they had uh, well they had a sale and hot dogs and stuff but 10 years of their boutique uh, operating and providing funding to keep their programs going it's pretty cool 12 of their volunteers have been 
there since day one, which is also, also really cool. And the boutique is entirely run by volunteers, which is also really cool. So the money that they're making there is going uh, directly into their programming. Uh, the CHOP challenge that was mentioned earlier is April 26, 530 to 7 at Federal Way High School. And it supports Bridging the Gap, which is a program which provides a backpack of food for children who uh, do not have food for the weekend. The Kiwanis Club is very engaged in supporting that, and this is our second year. Uh, we attended last year. It was really fun. Two chefs take what would be in a typical backpack, and they create a meal out of that. And then they have judges from the community who judge the meal and decide which one wins. So um, it is really a fun thing to do. You do need to pre-register, and there's a suggested, suggested donation to, to leave uh, when you leave the, the evening there. Today we had our first service club meeting since COVID, and uh, we had, uh, I think, eight people there. And uh, we will be meeting every month. So if you are a service club or uh, organization that does things here in Federal Way and you're interested in joining us, please let me know. And I'll, I'll get you contact, get you on the contact list. And uh, I think it was last weekend or maybe the weekend before, the Federal Way Public Market had a meeting down at Dumas Bay and uh, my family and I were able to attend. They had a good turnout, and uh, Ron was there. So thank you for your presentation there and your video. That was very interesting. And thank you for the pin. I appreciate it. Councilor McDaniel. Yeah, I got a, a couple items. Uh, the first one, I'll start with the positive, actually. Um, two weeks ago, we had uh, an, um, a regional uh, jiu-jitsu grappling competition down in Puyallup at the um, fairgrounds. and. We have families who come from five or six other states, Montana, Idaho, Oregon, Washington, Alaska a lot of times. Sometimes they come from California and stuff like that. And in the two-day event, you see children on one day and adults on the other day. And the kids I teach on Tuesday, uh, Saturdays, I found out are Generation Alpha, which is the youngest group out there. So it's pretty much five to, I don't know, four or five, up to like seven or eight for the most part. And it was, uh, it gave me hope. Usually I'm, I'm pretty disgruntled about, you know, what the future is going to look like around this place because of what's going on in society. But uh, it gave me hope knowing those families who dedicate that much to bring their kids out. And I saw kids for the first time who have been smashed for years or months, years, depending on who they are, uh, actually compete and win once or twice. And just to see them get a point or a takedown or anything, it was like they won a gold medal at the Olympics. And it was kind of cool to see the actual personality and seeing, uh, you know, the person you're trying to pull out of them when you see them coming into the, to the mats and they don't want to even engage with anybody, actually go out there and engage and, and get a victory. And I thought that was awesome. And then um, <laughs> this last weekend, I went down to a beer with my, uh, my chick and uh, hung out at some of the local restaurants down there. And... Um, had, uh, had one too many drinks, so I decided to walk home, and it was um, an eye-opening experience. I don't know if anybody's been down to Burien lately, down by the city hall in the library, but I'll tell you right now, I've been to war zones, and um, I saw some pure evil down there at that library. The stuff that's going on there is insane, and the fact that it's being allowed to be there and kids walk by and see it is something that I'm glad we do not have in the city, and I'll do anything in my, my power to make sure that never happens. So as much as I push back sometimes with the police, I am so glad that they do a way better job than what I was seeing happening in that place. Uh, and then the last one, um, like I would mentioned beforehand, I'm starting to engage more with my uh, council responsibilities, and I started going to some of the committees we have, and I've been to the youth, and I've been to the senior uh, commissions, excuse me, and I'll be shooting for diversity in arts this next month and trying to get a better understanding of how um, the people who volunteer out of the community to come in and sit on those uh, platforms uh, help us and uh, build up what we have going on. Thank you. Very good. All right. Councilor Seven Dawson. Thank you, Mayor, and I have nothing to report on. All right, thank you. Um, all right, Council President. No report. All right, thank you. Actually, I, I spoke with uh, Karen Brigado of the Arts and uh, Diver of the Arts uh, Commission, and also what's that? Parks. Parks. parks thank you. Uh, arts and Parks, um, and uh, also Kenny Byrne of the uh, uh, Parks uh, Commission, and. Uh, Arts Commission, thank you. And over them, and uh, they're going to be gathering. We're going to have a big confab of all of the commissions. I know that I saw some email traffic, but I talked to them uh, in my office, um, and uh, they want to get 
uh, the commissioners together. We're going to make sure it's all uh, copacetic in regard to um, uh, in regard to uh, internal rules and, and quorums and all that. But we're going to be getting all those folks together, and and uh, Bill is is working on that. So um, I, I think that's uh, pretty much all I had. I wanted to, since we were talking about that. It'd be great if council could also be involved. Oh sure, of since course. we appoint yeah, of course. those folks in. They're, they're, they're council commissions, so that's yes. why I wanted to, absolutely. Uh, okay, uh, with that, um, great job, everybody. Uh, we are adjourned.